I live on a 20 acre horse ranch in the panhandle of Florida, about a half hour from the Alabama border. And 15 minutes ago, I heard the strangest animal sound I've ever heard, if it was an animal. It happened almost right outside the property, which is only about 50 feet away from where I am now. It was a very loud whistle. I heard it four times, spaced out by like 15 to 30 seconds, and each whistle was different. No repeating tunes or notes. It was loud enough to sound like it was echoing across the property. After the four independent whistled tunes, it was followed by a sound that almost sounded like a frustrated sigh. Then nothing. Then the whole thing would start all over again. I sat there listening to this, like somebody was just facing the property outside the fence line, whistling four different tunes, huffing in frustration, and then doing it again. What's even stranger is that it was dead quiet while this was happening. Shortly after the silence, I could hear a pack of coyotes in the distance, which happens all the time. The owls over the lake, which is also frequent. But while this was happening, I didn't hear any of that. Also, to be clear, where the sound was coming from is an open field. It's so dark I can't see my hand in front of my face when I go out there. The weirdest thing is, we're more likely to hear gunshots than other people out here. The closest neighbors are like a half mile away in the other direction. This sound came from the road side of the property. The closest neighbors in that direction are over a mile away. We also have two donkeys on the property to ward off predators, and I didn't hear either of them warning the herd, which would mean that maybe it was a human I was hearing. But like I said, the property is fenced and gated, so they would have had to hop the fence. And whistling is a really weird thing to do when you're trespassing in an area where shooting is common. Update. It's now 30 minutes after the initial thing happened. I hear the horses running fast away from where the sound originated. Then, about a minute later, I hear their hooves heading back to where the sound originated. This happened several times. I am really confused. Redditor OK Armadillo 3754 went out on a two-week trip through Washington with his girlfriend. They decided not to plan anything and just see where the trip took them. They got a little bit more of the unplanned than they bargained for. This is their story. A couple of years ago, my girlfriend and I decided to take a two-week trip to Washington State. One of the main goals of our trip was to plan virtually nothing. We wanted to take off, let adventure guide us, stop when we saw something cool, and go back home when it was time. So that's what we did. We started out and just made it up as we went along. It was incredible. First we visited Yakima, Washington. Then we traveled over to Seattle, wandered through Olympia, explored Bremerton, and eventually made it to Forks. At this point, we decided to go to the Ho Rainforest, which is one of the largest temperate rainforests in the United States. After we'd been there for a while, wandering through in the car, we realized we'd somehow gotten lost. In fact, we were about 20 miles off track, and we ended up in what looked like a tree logging operation. Everywhere we looked, we saw these wide open sections with tree stumps as far as the eye could see. Traveling through this area, the sun began to set. I can't remember exactly what time of day it was when we saw it, but off in the distance, maybe 100 to 125 yards, I saw movement. Whatever it was, it was moving quite fast, and that intrigued me. I slowed down the car and kept my eyes on the figure, trying to see what it was. At first, I thought it was just a bear, 
Then, as it passed through a cleared area, I realized something that made my hair stand on end. It was running on its hind legs. I watched for about 15 seconds before this thing finally disappeared into the forest. Whatever it was, it was going at least 30 miles per hour on its hind legs, over quite a distance. I have no explanation for what we saw, but whatever it was, it was no bear. I have a story to tell from when I was a young kid. I'd say this occurred around 2006 to 2008. I haven't told many people about this because it's absolutely insane, but it did happen, so here goes. My mom and I went camping in the woods of northern Wisconsin. When we arrived to the campground, we were the only people there, which was weird by itself, sure. Everything went semi-normal, until our tent filled to the brim with spiders, and we ended up sleeping in the car. It was about two to three in the morning, and I was wide awake because I was just restless, almost paranoid that somebody was out there in the woods. I looked out of the left rear window when I saw a large portal open. I don't know how else to describe it. I couldn't believe my eyes, so I pinched and kind of slapped myself to make sure I wasn't dreaming. I definitely wasn't. I could feel the pain. As I watched the portal, it got larger and wider, about seven to eight feet tall. It was bluish green, almost like Rick and Morty, ironically. Immediately after this, I woke up my mom to see if she could see what I was seeing. She did and freaked out a bit. I remember her saying, don't move and be quiet. I saw one humanoid figure come out with a lantern. He looked around and then gestured to the others to come out. I would say five to six people came out. They were all wearing what I would sort of describe as like Amish clothing and they all had lanterns as well. They gathered around each other and seemed to talk. And then, one by one, they all entered the woods in a single file line. The first man to walk out of the portal was the one to go back into the portal. After he got in, it closed. My mom and I watched as these people walked into the woods until we couldn't see their light anymore. My mom immediately started the car and we left in complete silence. We were silent the entire car ride back to Illinois. Ever since then, both my mom and I have been avid believers of the paranormal and aliens. I'm wondering if anyone has ever seen anything like this before. I know it sounds absolutely insane, but I swear it happened. I might even doubt myself if it weren't for the fact that my mom saw it too. In any case, it was the weirdest thing I have ever seen. One night shift, I was dispatched to the VA clinic. As it turned out, a juvenile was in a psychiatric appointment for hearing voices. The kid reportedly heard a pair of hatchets tell him to cut people. So of course, the mom brought him to a doctor. During the appointment, the mother grabbed the hatchets from a bag to show the psychiatrist. As soon as she put them in view, the kid grabbed them and ran out of the building and directly into the cemetery across the street. Thankfully, I was not asked to run alongside K-9 to track this kid, but they did find him without any major incidents. I was, however, 
tasked with bringing the kid to the centers for evaluation. And while he was in the back of my patrol car, we distracted him with questions while another officer very subtly placed the hatchets in my trunk. It was quiet for a while on the way, and all of a sudden the kid said, Sir, you have my hatchets in the trunk, don't you? I can feel them. I didn't verbally respond, but I simply laughed a little. I have never been so freaked out by anything to this day. The centers obviously wouldn't take the hatchets. My sergeant told me not to place them into evidence, and I tried to return them to the mother and she refused to take them. I think we ultimately threw them out, but I don't really know. I just hope they never reunite with that kid ever again. This story happened a few years ago. I lived in a building with my daughter, who grew attached to my neighbor's husband, Teddy, as if he were her dad. One day, while talking with my neighbor's wife, my daughter, who was two and a half years old at this time, came running to the door. But rather than running into my neighbor's apartment to go cuddle up Teddy, she froze at the doorway. She told his wife and I that we needed to be quiet as Teddy was sleeping. Teddy was not sleeping. He was, in fact, sitting on the couch watching TV. Teddy stood up and called for my daughter to come see him. Again, my daughter looked at his wife and I and told us that Teddy was sleeping and that we needed to be quiet. I could see she was getting upset at the fact that we were laughing while telling her that Teddy was awake and wants you to go sit with him. Teddy started approaching the doorway where we were standing my daughter began to cry and ran into our apartment screaming, No, Teddy is sleeping. I could feel the goosebumps running across my body. That same day, my daughter went to a relative's place for a sleepover. I had invited my neighbors to come over for a bit and Teddy came over and explained that he wasn't feeling the best. He said that he was breathing in and out of a paper bag before coming to my apartment. I insisted he go to the hospital to make sure he was all right. On the way, Teddy fell ill and asked to pull over so he could be sick at the side of the road. As he was kneeling beside the car, Teddy suffered a major heart attack and passed away while on the way to the hospital. When the service was held for Teddy, I had such a strong feeling that I had to bring my daughter with me. She brought her favorite blanket with her, of course. When my daughter and I got to the funeral home for the viewing, we were greeted by everyone in Teddy's family. They all knew who my daughter was, as Teddy used to talk about her all the time. I held my daughter close as we walked up to the casket where Teddy laid. My daughter leaned down, almost as if she was going to whisper to him. She then told me, See, Teddy is sleeping and he's really cold. She took her blanket and tucked Teddy in, then looked at me and said how he was warm and happy now. That night, as I sat alone in the living room, my phone began to ring. Four or five rings later and still no name appeared. I quickly answered the phone in the middle of a ring, only to hear the dial tone. The call didn't even show up as an incoming call afterwards. It felt like Teddy had called us to say goodbye. It was so strange that my daughter knew there was something wrong with Teddy before anything even happened. A few months later, we went to go visit my grandmother who was passing away from pancreatic cancer. My daughter refused to enter my grandmother's room. She kept saying how my grandmother was sleeping and that everyone should leave her alone to go sleep. I instantly began to cry. Only four days later, I got the call that my grandmother had passed away in her sleep. Back when I was a captain in the fire department, we responded to a house fire early in the morning. 
When we arrived, the roof was breached and flames had taken out two windows on the second floor of a split-level home. We made entry, and even though the roof was breached, the thermocline was about two feet off the first floor. We wouldn't have gone in at all, but a child was missing, and the father and mother had gotten out of the house, but they couldn't get to their daughter's room. The father was being treated for burns on his hands and forearms as he had tried to go in after her. Suffice to say, they were frantic. They told us that her room was on the second floor, second door to the right. Simple enough. We made entry and the stairs faced the door. Rapid bursts from the TFT to the ceiling brought the smoke level up to about four feet from the floor. That's when my handline man and I saw something that neither of us could explain. I saw motion to my left, down on the main floor. Somebody was walking around downstairs. I pointed to my handline man and he saw it too. We couldn't see a body as the person was in the smoke, but we could see the legs and the feet clearly. It looked to be a man wearing olive green trousers and leather shoes. I wouldn't say that the legs were dancing, but they were certainly moving in a way to get our attention. We redirect back down the stairs and see the legs go into a door on the right side of the small hallway. We both saw the legs go into that room. We get down the hallway and the door is closed. Feeling the door, there weren't flames behind it, so we made entry to discover that we were in a bathroom. The light was on and curled up in the bathtub was the little girl. There was no one else in the room with her. We broke out the window and got her to a second crew, keeping the house next door from catching on fire. We looked around the bathroom again and couldn't find the man that we had both seen going into the bathroom. There was nowhere for him to hide in there. We withdrew from the house and did exposure control as the house was a complete loss with the fire already ingressing into the living room. The parents had gone with their daughter to the hospital, where she was checked and cleared to go later that morning. The man had suffered only first and small second-degree burns on his hands and forearms. The family stopped by the station and wanted to thank us for saving their daughter. They asked us how we knew to check the first floor bathroom, and I asked them if they knew anything about a man in olive green trousers and leather shoes. The man pulled out his phone after a minute of thinking and showed us a picture of two old men standing on a lawn. One of the men was clearly wearing olive green trousers and those same leather shoes. The man that we had seen on the first floor had passed away in 1976, and it was the man's father. The little girl's grandfather had showed us where she was. We were all speechless. It's the only time that I've ever seen a ghost during a response, but I will never forget it. When this Redditor was traveling through Valley Forge National Park, they decided to pull over to capture the gorgeous moon. What happened next was an experience they've not yet forgotten. Here's the story. Sometime last year, we experienced a unique lunar event. I believe it was called the Super Blood Moon, but whatever it was called, it was absolutely enormous. It lit up the sky, was larger than any moon I had ever seen before, and it was beautiful. During this event, I was traveling through Valley Forge National Park at about 9 o'clock at night. Admiring the moon, I decided I wanted to take a picture of it, if I could do so safely. Fortunately, up on my right, I saw a parking area that still had its gate open. I pulled in so as to be safely out of the road, but only so far. I didn't want to go all the way into the lot for some reason. I stopped my car, exited the vehicle, and pulled out my phone. Kneeling down, I began to set up for my shot. 
the moon in view, I lifted my finger to take the photo and stopped. Every hair on the back of my neck was standing on end. Without warning and seemingly without reason, I felt an intense feeling of dread come over me. I felt as though a crowd of people was pressing in on every side, inching ever closer to me, some close enough to reach out and touch me. I closed my eyes for a moment and then turned around. Nothing. Facing the blackness did nothing to calm my nerves, though. In fact, seeing no visible reason for my fear only intensified it. Something in me felt as though I had pinpointed the source. I just couldn't see it. Not wanting to miss my chance to catch a photo of this beautiful moon, though, I turned around to face the camera once more. My hands shook, and I said into the night, I just want to take a picture of the moon, and then I'll be leaving, I promise. After saying this, I felt a slight reprieve in the oppressive feeling, and took two photos. Neither was in focus, though, and at that point I was so terrified that all I could think of was leaving. Cutting my losses on the shot, I took my phone and tripod, my two blurry photos, and scrambled to get back into the car. Throwing the car in reverse, I got out of that area as fast as I could. To this day, I have never stopped there again at night, and I don't intend to. There's an old wives' tale about this stretch of road in Maine, Route 182, a.k.a. Blackswoods Road. It's home to Catherine, the ghost hitchhiker, and the devil truck. I am still shaken to my very core by the experience I had five years ago. The story of Catherine I won't really comment on. There are lots of accounts of that. They even made episodes on shows about it. But what I'm going to talk about is much darker, the devil truck. This truck isn't talked about much, except by old timers at the gas station called Tideway. When they first told me about it, I didn't believe it. Boy, I wish I would have before I left the store that night. But anyway, I thought, great, old timers telling me some BS because I just moved here. I should add that at this time, I was a fresh deputy with Waldo County, so I grabbed an orange juice out of the cooler because they didn't have the Gatorade I liked, told the old timers I was going to head home because I had a long day shift, paid for my drink, and left. Here's the creepy part. I live on 182. So I started driving home normally in my take-home vehicle. I pulled out of the gas station and sped off. I set the cruise control and the charger to 50 miles per hour and just started thinking about what I wanted for supper. About three miles after the gas station, a truck pulls out behind me. I didn't think much of it, except that it was weird to see a 72 F100 out on the roads this late. Then out of nowhere, about 25 minutes after pulling out behind me, the truck rams the back of the cruiser, sending me sideways. I remember slamming into a tree and spinning back across the road into the guardrail that separates the road from Fox Pond. I instantly put on my blues so traffic would see me, since my headlights were facing right where the blind spot was on the road. I got out looking for the truck, thinking it had to be a problem with the truck. Surely somebody wouldn't try to kill a sheriff's deputy in Maine. There was no truck. There wasn't even a sign of a truck. I tried to call it in, but my car radio wouldn't work. Luckily, one of the old timers from the store was traveling home as well and stopped to help. What he said to me haunts me every time I drive that road at night. Must have been going fast. Devil truck doesn't like speeders. After he said that, I went to look at the tree that I hit and saw a speed limit sign that somebody must have ripped out. 
It was lying right about the point of impact where the truck had hit me. Speed limit, 45. Sure enough, I was speeding. And I guess the devil truck didn't like it. I was an EMT and then a paramedic for eight years before becoming a registered nurse. It was a decent sized city, 100,000 plus citizens, and loads of weird history. I had a lot of things happen, but this is the story that I will never forget. There was one house that we would go to pretty regularly that was beyond haunted. I don't know who or what lived and died in there before the then present patient. There were mannequins in the living room, several. I never asked because I didn't want to be in there any longer than necessary. The first time we were called there, I stood on the stoop trying to will my body to go in. The atmosphere in there was intimidating. It almost felt like the house was saying, come in if you dare. My partner was male, so I thought, meh, we'll be fine. I'm a five foot four female, and I can hold my own in a bar fight. Threatening presences I cannot see are another story. We get to our patient, and as I'm hooking up the EKG, someone backed into me, knocking me off the balls of my feet. I was squatting next to the couch. I tell my partner to back up, and he says, from what? I look up and he's on the other side of the room, nowhere near me or the couch. So I turn around. There's nothing there, but I'm eyeballing these mannequins up against the wall, a good 15 to 20 feet away. I shake it off and go back to what I'm doing, and again I'm knocked over. I tell my partner to knock it off, but now he isn't even in the room. He wandered to the kitchen to gather the patient's medications. Now I'm on my feet. There's no way that this happened twice from nothing. I turn back to these mannequins again. One has shifted slightly away from the wall, now standing with a shoulder to it, when before its back was against it. I asked the patient a bit too late if anyone else was in the home. Scene safety should have been first, but yeah, oops. She said no, it was just her and the cat. Thinking this cat must be a puma or something, I start to look for it. Unfortunately, Peanut was no bigger than my American size seven foot. I had only ventured to the hallway, maybe 10 feet from the couch, but out of view of the mannequins. When I walked back into the living room, that mannequin was now facing me. Every hair on my body stood up. Not today, Satan. We packaged her up, got her in the truck for transport, and got away from that tiny house. Lo and behold, dispatch sends a request to my tablet for an explanation of a long scene time. I had to put harassed by mannequins in a run ticket without looking like I needed to be on a 72 hour hold. We went back to that house three more times that month. I called from the door for her to come to me. I'm not that stupid. I will never go in there again unless I absolutely have to. I'm telling this story to maybe get some help in identifying what I saw because I've been trying to figure it out for three years. I was a U.S. Marine from 2014 to 2019. I deployed to the Philippines to help out some joint operations. It was right after the siege of Marawi. Basically all we did was stare at the top of the jungle canopy, looking for heat signals and then communicating fire missions for artillery. We were about three months into the deployment and like four hours into this mission staring at absolutely nothing. We were over the mountains of Basilon with really thick jungle canopy. 
Even with infrared, it's really hard to see anything out there. It was like trying to find needles in a haystack with Vaseline in your eyes. But when something's above the canopy, like a helicopter, birds, or monkeys in the trees, it pops up and you can really get some good definition depending on how good the camera operator is and atmospherics, of course. I was the camera guy and I was just chilling, staring into the void while my pilot burned circles into the sky for hours. I asked my officer in charge of the flight if I could go smoke while the pilot took over the camera after I locked on to a geopoint to keep the camera from going all over the place, and he said yes. So I go smoke, and not a minute later, I hear the guy inside flying go, Uh, hey dude, you should get back in here and look at this. So I go back inside all pissed off because I hadn't got to finish my cigarette. But then I see what my pilot had locked the camera onto. I hopped back into my seat, and I took back control. I was like, all right, is it cows or ISIS? But it's none of those things. It's just flying above the canopy at a pretty good clip, flapping and gliding on what I can only assume are very large pointed wings. At this point, it's just a very dark shape moving over the canopy until I clean up the infrared image and start to pick out more. At first I'm like, dude, it's just a really big bird. But then I see like a rounded head at the front and a small space in between what I assumed was the tail, making me think it had some kind of legs. The detail wasn't amazing, but you could make out general shapes. If I have a good day for atmospherics and light and altitude, I can tell an RPG from an AK-47 if I'm lucky. That kind of detail. Then my smart, college-educated officer is like, check the measuring tool. It looks kind of big. We have a tool that uses geodata, altitude, and the aircraft's position, allowing you to use the laser and the program to let you know how far a distance is between two points. We mostly use it to measure buildings and artillery shot distances, but given what we had in the height of the canopy, I didn't see why it wouldn't work for this too. So I take a screen cap of my cam and I send it to my pilot to work on while I'm still on lock. He does the math and he comes up with a roughly six foot length and a 17 foot wingspan. As I watched it fly, I just kept thinking, that looks like a bat just the way that it flapped and moved and the general shape. It wasn't a bird, and its wings definitely came out at like an angle and stretched, you know, just like a bat. But there's no bat that big. The crew and I talked about it, passed it up to hire, but eventually we had to actually go do our jobs instead of become amateur zoologists. But after that flight, I just couldn't shake that feeling or place what it was. The other thing was that right next to our smoke pit, when we're not flying the drones, there's this thing that's absolutely filled with fruit bats, and it glows in infrared. This thing didn't. So my pilot and I got curious and we started asking the local people and contractors who worked at the chow hall and at the PX. A bunch of them laughed and told us that it was because we stay up too late and we work too long on night shift. But a couple of the older ones told us about an Aswang or a Tik Tik. Sometimes people call it a Mananangal. Apparently it's this big old flying thing that eats babies. But in an effort to disprove giant baby eating women man bats, can somebody please tell me what I saw? Because I would much rather my spicy PTSD just be regular PTSD. I live outside Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we went on a family vacation to Hershey, Pennsylvania, which was roughly 200 miles away, taking just under a three and a half hour trip. One morning, while I was at the hotel, I decided to take a shower. As usual, I took off my wedding ring, 
and left it on the counter next to the sink. However, this time, in my rush and excitement to get going, I forgot to put it back on after finishing up. It wasn't until I got in the car that I realized I wasn't wearing it. I quickly ran back inside the hotel room and searched every inch of the bathroom, my suitcase, and turned every article of clothing I had worn that week inside out. But the ring was nowhere to be found. Feeling a bit desperate, I decided to leave a description of the ring at the front desk, hoping that the cleaning crew might find it. I tried to reassure them that it really wasn't worth stealing. It was just a simple 14 karat white gold ring with no engravings or anything like that. In fact, I even joked that it might be mistaken for a washer or a nut, understanding if they ended up throwing it out. Despite my best efforts and one last deep dive into everything in that room that night, I had almost given up hope of finding the ring. My wife wasn't too upset, considering I had recently lost some weight, causing the ring to constantly slide off my finger. I had experienced miraculous recoveries of the ring in the past, like finding it while cutting the grass or shoveling snow, even in public pools and bars, places where it should have been lost forever. So she had suggested that I get it resized anyway, but eventually we decided to just replace it entirely. Fast forward three years and I was doing some spring cleaning in my house. At one point, I took all the cushions off the couch and flipped it upside down to get rid of the crumbs left by my kids. When I picked up the couch again, to my astonishment, there sat my old wedding ring right in the middle of the floor. I verified that it was indeed the same ring I had lost years ago, now too big for my finger. Strangely, it looked exactly like the new one that I had bought from the same jeweler, who still had my records and matched it perfectly in a smaller size. The most puzzling part was how, after three years, the ring had seemingly teleported from that hotel to my couch, a couch that I had thoroughly cleaned several times during that time span. I still don't know how it got back to me, but it has become a cherished keepsake with a cool story to go along with it. This happened on June 29th of this year outside the main city of Pittsburgh. My partner and I went to the city for an event and had driven five hours to get there. We were cheap, so we took a hotel about 20 minutes away from the main city in a busy, bustling shopping district. There was a Walmart, Ikea, lots of food places, stuff like that. It was very big and busy, even for nighttime. This was about midnight. We went to the hotel for a bit and then went to go somewhere else but we needed to go to the gas station first. I looked one up on Google Maps on my partner's phone. Awesome, two 24 hour stations right off the road where we needed to travel. So we turn in, go up a short curved road and pulled into this little spot where the stations were supposed to be. You can't see them from the road, but they were atop a small hill overlooking it. We started to unbuckle and then my partner noticed that both places were closed not just the store part. The entirety of both stations were completely dark, including pumps, lights, except one street light, which weirdly made everything bluish, and this little diner nearby too. These were 24 hour pumps. We checked after as it was still on the phone screen. In addition, the whole thing just felt weird. Like it legitimately felt as if we weren't supposed to be there. We kind of just sat in awe, looking around for a moment, then drove out as quickly as possible and went to a different place that was normal. Nothing freaky followed us, thankfully. We had a great time at the event and forgot about this weirdness every time we drove. If we go back next year though, I'm gonna try to find the place again. Maybe there was something wrong with the wires for just those three buildings. Maybe there was something else that needed both of them to shut down completely, but the fact that it showed up on Google Maps with the day's average prices, as well as 24 hours open, 
And when we got there, it felt like we drove straight into the Twilight Zone. It was all just really weird. into my house about two years ago. It's a generally decent sized property with 14 and a half acres. I don't hate this house, but it is 100% cursed. I've always felt really uneasy going into the wooded area of this property. I would never go in there alone because I got really scared. I know that sounds very childish, but hear me out. There's a small abandoned cottage or shed in the woods, and that's the part that's always made me feel very faint, going within a five to 10 foot radius of it. There didn't seem to be anything particularly odd about this building, and there was nothing around it. A couple of months went by, and I decided to go in alone, just to face my fear of those woods. I came upon the building and stayed on the trail so I wouldn't get dizzy and start to faint. This in particular scared the living bejesus out of me because I was looking at the building and I saw a woman circling it, humming lullabies and calling out for something. I think she was between the height of maybe 5'10 and 6 foot with dark hair that went down to about her hips and very pale skin. She was wearing a long white dress or nightgown that went down to her ankles and held a children's toy in her hand. I called out, hello? And she just stared at me, still humming and circling the building, but looking at me. I made the very dumb decision to step into that five to 10 foot radius and she lunged for me. I started running for my life out of the woods and she just kept chasing me. The second I stepped outside the tree line though, I turned around and she was gone. It wasn't until later that I was reflecting on it and I thought, wait a minute, I recognized that toy she was holding. I had the exact same one when I was little. After that, I started to go back She's not always there when I go into the woods, but when she is, she's always holding a different children's toy, all of which were toys or plushies that I had as a kid or grew up with in my home. One of them was a big plush that I've had since I was born. I still have it because it's kind of my comfort item, but hers was an exact duplicate. That's what scared me the most. I'm pretty sure I'm not crazy, so my only conclusion is that I'm dealing with something very paranormal. So I live in a small town in the southwest of Scotland. One of those towns where if you don't know someone, you will definitely know one of their friends. In 2015, I moved into a flat or apartment with my two children and my partner. The flat seemed nice and it was in a quiet part of town. Needless to say, we were all really happy with the move. At the time, my eldest son Bobby was four and my youngest Derek was three. Soon after moving in, I started noticing strange things happening. For example, the washing machine turned itself on and off at the wall. Doors opened on their own. But the strangest incidents were yet to come. One night, when the kids were in bed, about six months after moving in, Bobby came running to the living room and said, Daddy, please could you come and tell the hand in my room to stop trying to play with my teddy bears? So naturally, I went into his room and told this what I thought was imaginary hand off. About two weeks later, my son Bobby came to me again. With the complete matter-of-fact innocence of a child, he goes, Daddy, did you know there's a ghost in your attic? I didn't think much of it, 
kids will be kids. The next day I was at work, talking to a colleague about where we'd moved to. Out of nowhere, he goes, Hey, did you know that back in April of 2014, some young guy hung himself in your flat? Suddenly, Bobby talking about a ghost in the attic started to feel a lot more concerning. What blows my mind is that Bobby had never talked about ghosts before moving here. At the time, he didn't even know what an attic or a loft was. I did some digging and even spoke to a friend who's a local police officer. I asked him about the whole incident with the young guy, and he goes, Oh yeah, that's true. He hung himself in the attic up there. We still live in that house, and to this day, strange things happen from time to time. Most recently, the TV turned itself on and turned the volume up to full blast, all on its own. I was the only one home at the time. What's really strange is that my youngest son Derek has never mentioned anything ghostly. It's all very strange, but very real. I grew up in a small California desert tourist town called Joshua Tree, home of the Joshua Tree National Park. Those of us that are older call it the Monument, as it was that before it was National Parkdom. I was in my early 20s at the time, which was approximately 15 to 16 years ago, and I was the only one with a car and a license. Growing up in a small desert town leaves you with limited options for fun, and we would always make use of the park. Occasionally, maybe once a week or so, a group of us would pile into the station wagon with beer, smokes, and a mixtape, and drive through the park late at night. An empty road, so dark and quiet, other than the loud group of guys in a red Mercury driving fast from one entrance to the other, was just the kind of vibe we liked. Hours would go by each time as we drove along the desolate road and stopped at various rocks that we liked to climb on. I cannot overstate how desolate it was, how alone we felt. No other cars, no other lights, except the occasional lonely unmanned roadwork sign when warranted. That's exactly what we thought it was at first, but I'm getting ahead of myself. This trip started like every other, except maybe more of us than usual. Crammed in that car, windows down as I chain smoked and drove a good 20 miles an hour over the speed limit, gravel was spitting up as we were driving along having a great time. Shortly into the trip, I saw a light, a blue light, possibly. It was miles and miles ahead, but that's the thing about the dark, dark like you get out in the desert. The light can shine for miles, I remember saying something about having to slow down at some point ahead. Must be some kind of construction sign left up, I thought. Had to be a sign. The light hadn't moved. We continued for a few miles to one of our favorite stops and got out. We climbed for a while. Maybe 45 minutes or so. We drank a little. We joked a lot. The norm. Then we piled back in and continued. To be very clear, this light never moved, and we'd already been about an hour into our adventure. A question that I kept thinking, though, was why would a sign have a blue light? It's very unusual. But we still figured it was a sign because it was so stationary. As we approached the light, I started to slow down. I slowed more and more as we approached the source. It wasn't a sign. It wasn't a car. It wasn't even a UFO. Standing on the side of the road, facing toward us, unmoving for over an hour at this point, was a man. A pale white man with a white beard, dirty old miner clothing, and an old mining helmet. He was holding a pickaxe, 
period appropriate for a time long before the park was anything other than desert with some lonely minds. His light was giving off this unnatural and bright blue light. His face was blank, but he stared at us, directly at all of us. We sped up, and as we drove by faster, his head turned to keep pace with us as we left. His light was visible, unmoving once again, facing us the entire trip out. It never flickered. It never moved. He wasn't translucent, but the saying as white as a ghost applied to everything about him other than his clothes, pickaxe, and light. I remember looking at the car clock shortly after passing him. It was almost exactly 1 a.m. when we passed. We never saw a car. We never saw a horse. We never saw any way for this old, sickly, pale miner to have gotten into the park. There was no reason for him to be there. Any means of transportation would have been visible if nearby. Worst of all, we estimated that this miner had to have been standing there, facing us, for at least an hour and a half, never moving. The eeriest part by far was how still he'd been the whole time, waiting, perhaps, to see us. Not once did that light flicker as if he looked down for a moment or turned his head. He just stood there, staring down a road at a car full of idiots. Even when we were parked, headlights off and climbing on some rocks while balancing a beer in hand, he stared from miles away into the darkness in our direction. We would have been no more than darkness to any human that far away without our headlights. We never saw him again. However, a few years ago, I decided to check to see if anybody had ever experienced something similar. I found one other story of a couple that saw him almost in the same place that we did, standing there staring down the road late at night. Then I found another story of some people who were camping out in the dark away from the standard campsites, and they saw the silhouette of what they thought was a miner walking by very close to them. I wish we would have stopped. Even if it would have been the most horrifying thing ever, I wish we would have stopped because I honestly believe there was a ghost of a dead miner out in that park. And I would know for sure today. I wouldn't have so many questions. There are plenty of unexplained things that I've encountered in my life. But the visage of the miner still sits fresh to this day. I worked as a paramedic on an ambulance during the night shift. One morning, we received a medical call for a patient who was having difficulty breathing. Upon arrival, we entered the patient's home, which was one of the smallest homes I have ever seen. It was about 400 square feet total. You walked into the living room, which connects to a kitchen and then connects to the only bedroom. When we walked in, we saw the patient in the back of the room. During our assessment of her, the cops that were with us kept asking if somebody else was in the house because they said they thought they heard something. With the patient's size and the condition of the front porch, we decided to go out of the sliding door inside the patient's room. After getting the patient into the ambulance, I went back inside the home while the police left for another call after helping lift the patient. I was going in the back room to get our bags and turn off the lights, but when I entered the home, the lights were off. They had all been on just moments before, and it's not like the snow was bad enough to take down power lines in that amount of time. We checked later and no power had gone out anywhere else. I tried the lights to no avail. I thought it was weird, but I didn't think much of it. Then I was walking in the kitchen when I looked down to find our bags all piled up and zipped up. I then felt that there was something in the house. I grabbed the bags and ran out. 
I found out right after getting outside that my radio had died. It was fully charged when I walked in there. I had thought that the cops put the bags in the kitchen, but they were outside the home before us to help the patient. I was the last one out of that house, and our bags were opened up all the way because we had to get the patient various items from each bag. I have no explanation for how our bags got packed up and zipped up, and to this day, nobody is taking credit. When my dad was little, he used to spend a lot of time at his grandmother's. She lived up in the mountains, and she was one of those people who just took care of everyone. He said that he lost count of all the times that drunks or people on drugs would come in at all hours of the night, and she would always feed them, let them rest, and then send them on their way. She was a kind person, but also one who, what you see, is what you get and she wasn't afraid to tell you what was on her mind. He said that he grew up not being scared of much because of her, and he thought the world of her. But there was one event that happened to him in the woods that scares him to this day. It's one of the reasons that he barely hunts or scouts alone, if he can help it. He was about 17 or 18, and he had stayed with his grandmother so that he could go deer scouting the next morning. The next day, he gets up early and heads out. My dad has a good sense of direction, but for some reason that day, he got turned around and lost in the dense forests of the mountains. He walked and walked, and night fell, with him still clueless on whereabouts he was. Tired, frustrated, and a little uneasy, he stopped to take a break and sat down. He said that it was just pitch dark, so much so that his little flashlight didn't give him much light at all. He was thirsty and starving, and he just wanted to get back to his grandmother's. As he sat there, thinking about where to go, he heard heavy footsteps and twigs snapping behind him. This scared him at first, thinking that he might have come across a bear. He stood up, knowing that if it was, he needed to get the hell out of there, but to not be hasty about it, so as to spook it. He just starts calmly walking away, hoping that he was going in the right direction this time. But the footsteps followed him. They were extremely heavy, thudding behind him a distance away. But as he walked, he noticed that they were speeding up. My dad starts walking faster, and as you can guess, the footsteps become faster. In a short time, he hears them now maybe a couple of yards behind him. Scared out of his mind, he turns around and shines his little flashlight to see nothing except these huge hoof prints. In their wake, the grass was dead and everything around it was dying with each step. He starts freaking out and straight out sprints, not caring which way he's going. He just wants to get as far away from whatever that is as possible. The footsteps behind him are following suit, sprinting after him. He only glances back once more, still seeing nothing but giant hoof prints and dead grass, leaves, and things like that wherever they had landed. By now, he's not sure how long or how far he's been running when he sees lights in the distance. He runs toward them hoping that somebody can help him if he's come upon a house or a store. He breaks out of the woods and joy floods over him when he sees that it's his grandmother's home. She's sitting on the porch. The lights outside are on. His grandmother was a religious woman, so she was reading her Bible at the time. It's embarrassing for him to admit now, but he said that he started screaming for her, tears falling down his cheeks and she stands up and looks behind him. That's when she sees the hoof prints and hears the sounds herself. She holds her hand out to him and he grabs onto it tightly. She pulls him to her and then says loudly, you can't have him. 
He said that the silence that lingered after that was intense. He had buried his head into her shoulder, so when he looked up, all he could see were the hoof prints and the dead grass and leaves. She just held on to him as he cried, whispering to him that he was okay and that it was gone. He has no idea what was after him that night, and he doesn't want to know, but he's pretty sure that his grandmother saved his life that night. While kayaking on Green River, traveling above Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, these friends would encounter a sound they had never heard before, and one they hoped to never hear again. Here's their story. A few years ago, my friends and I went on a 45-mile, three-night kayaking trip down the Green River in Kentucky, which runs above the Mammoth Cave System, the world's longest known cave system with more than 400 miles of surveyed passageways. We brought everything we needed in our kayaks and one canoe, food, tents, water filtration, etc., and camped each night on the riverbank when it started getting dark, and we found level enough ground most of the time. The first night was uneventful, except to say that there is nothing like a wall of fireflies against a mountainous black tree line at night in the middle of nowhere beautiful. The second day around sunset, after a long day of kayaking and baking in the July heat, we came upon a stream on the bank that opened up into a large ravine. The stream, as we found out, was a cave spring, pouring out blue, freezing cold cave water into a lagoon about 30 feet wide and so deep that the blue water turned black after a few feet. The lagoon had a long, sandy beach, secluded by hills on either side, and a tall, overhanging cliff behind and above us. It was a beautiful, otherworldly place. Time moved very slowly there. We decided to camp there for the night. The sand was soft, white, and very fine, ideal for ground sleeping. For some reason, the place deeply frightened me, but I didn't speak up. We were all tired, and everyone was having fun. We built a small fire and enjoyed the stars through the leaf canopy for a while before everybody went to bed. I slept hard that night. At around 5 a.m., I woke up with an urge to relieve myself. It was still dark. I had the tent door zipper about halfway opened and had just popped my head out when I heard a loud and terrible roar or scream. I immediately cowered back into the tent and zipped it closed, and I waited. The scream came from about 10 feet to my left, near the dwindling fire. It was high-pitched, not like an owl's screech, although I'm not ruling that out. It was a wretched, pained scream that got lower pitched toward the end. Being that we were in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky, most likely it was a fox or a boar or some kind of bird. Whatever it was, I lay awake for an hour, listening. I heard absolutely nothing. Granted, we were on a soft beach, but I didn't hear a single twig snap or leaf crinkle when whatever it was finally shuffled away. It was bizarre. I should mention at this time that up the beach and off to the side of the lagoon was a small, dry cave opening, maybe three feet wide. I cannot say with any certainty that it was not some ancient cave-dwelling creature that surfaced to investigate our camp. I somehow fell back asleep and awoke the next morning shaken. I asked if any of my friends had heard the terrible scream, but remarkably, Nobody had. We pressed on down the Green River. The third night, at dusk, we came upon a large rocky beach. We pulled our boats ashore and decided that this would have to do, as we didn't want to go any farther downriver and risk being stuck on the water at dark. 
This rocky beach was where the river split in two and, in the middle, formed a collection of pale rocks, tall grass and dried out wood, a desolate pile of muck the size of a football field. The landmass was covered in jumping sand spiders and tiny frogs. Again, otherworldly. We set up camp, ate, and all went to bed around the same time. It was silent for probably 20 or 30 minutes, I'm not sure. I was asleep, as the others most likely were as well. Suddenly, my dream was interrupted by what sounded like a booming, loud, mechanical, wooden beast. I awoke and shot straight up. It was truly the loudest thing I have ever heard. It sounded like a massive bulldozer, tearing down a huge steel and wood building. Then came a boom, followed by its echo throughout the river valley. The animals shifted, and the birds flew away. We were all awoken by the crash and yelling in confusion to each other in our tents. Nothing but silence followed outside our tents, and nobody was particularly willing to shine a flashlight toward the woods. Eventually, we all decided it had to have been a falling tree, and we went back to sleep. The next morning, I thought about it some more, it didn't sound like just a falling tree. I must stress that it had a metallic quality and it was projected purposefully. It almost sounded like a roar. In the morning light, we found no evidence of anything out of the ordinary, nor any obvious fallen trees that could have made such a loud sound. So we packed up and headed out onto the river one last time to go home. My friends and I still talk about that trip and all the strange things that happened. We did the same kayak trip a couple of years later, and nothing out of the ordinary happened at all. No mysterious forest noises, to both my disappointment and relief. In the summer, my parents rented an Airbnb in Holton, Maine. It was a very old farmhouse, but it was recently renovated. The fields and sunsets were beautiful. I always felt like something was watching me. It wasn't a bad feeling, though. We celebrated my birthday there, and that night I had a crazy dream. A woman named Gladys introduced herself to me and told me that this was her home. She told me she loved having my family and I there. She said that she never wanted us to leave. She also said that our birthdays are very close together as well. In the dream, Gladys and I played a board game and talked about so much, her past, her family, things like that. I tried so hard not to Google her name and see what came up until after I left to go home, but my curiosity got the best of me. Turns out there was an old woman named Gladys who lived there and died about a year earlier. Her birthday was August 10th and mine is August 7th. The picture that was in her obituary looked exactly like the woman that I saw in the dream. That's how I know that it was her. This happened almost 30 years ago, and I cannot forget about this person, if it was a person. I was spending the night at my boyfriend's mom's house, which I did almost every weekend while he was away at sea. Usually I slept on the couch in the family room, which was quite comfortable. Mrs. D always left a nightlight on in each room in case anybody needed to get up during the night. I awoke for some reason, and standing right before me was a fellow who looked like he was about to die of thirst. He was terribly sunburned, and his hair looked like it was sunbleached, almost like hay. 
He didn't say a word, but looked at me with such sorrow and hopelessness. He was dressed in worn clothes that I later found out were identical to some of the old 1860s photos of miners. This all happened in Santa Ana, California, just for some added context. His cotton shirt was collared and buttoned down, but very soiled. He had a cotton jacket of some sort as well. His boots were also of leather and very dirty and worn. His eyes were light and clear, but also very sad. His skin was creased and cracked looking. He didn't answer me when I asked if he was okay, so I said that I would go and wake Mrs. D. At this point, I genuinely didn't think he was a ghost. I thought he was alive and maybe an old friend of the family's. It would have been totally natural, since this family had many friends and relatives that regularly came to visit. Anyway, I got up to go toward the hall where Mrs. D's bedroom door was. But when I turned to him as I passed, he was gone. There is absolutely no physical way that he could have gotten out of the house in that amount of time without me hearing it or noticing. He literally disappeared in front of my eyes. I never saw him after that, but to this day, I feel a deep sadness and compassion for the man who might have died trying to find some gold or silver after the gold rush was already over. The look of desperation on his face is one that I will never forget. This happened in Fresno County, November 2015, around 3 o'clock in the morning. I am a medic on an ALS unit, and I was working my normal 1900 shift. I was dispatched to a Code 3 cardiac arrest for a side hanging at around 3 o'clock. The call info only had that the patient was a 34-year-old male hanging and the sheriff and PD were on scene. The location was in the more desolate farm properties in the valley. No street lights, just dark, cold, and engulfed in dense fog during the winter. Rolling up, I see a man dressed head to toe in black. Black shoes, black pants, black long sleeve shirt, black beanie, I mean everything. He was in handcuffs, sitting on his hands, with two officers surrounding him, a female, and two very young kids by the house's front door. There was a broken rope noose on the ground underneath this oddly large, wicked-looking gray skeleton of a tree. The man had a small laceration and a rope burn on his neck, but he was very much alive. When looking at him, his eyes had little of the white and were black. He was quiet until I sat him on the ambulance gurney. The man was sobbing, trembling, and screaming that he can't take it anymore. As I was putting on our leather restraints on his wrists, I noticed that he had deep horizontal cutting scars along both of his wrists. He was only trembling now, as if he was scared. All I could feel was cold. This man was clearly struggling and decided that night he would give up and end it all, leaving his wife or girlfriend and two children behind. So far, just a sad story, right? Well, this is where it gets freaky. I have never seen anything like this or heard of an experience like this ever before. Three years later, it still gives me the chills every time I think about it. On the way to the hospital, a few good miles down the road, we made a wrong turn, got a little lost and took a back road. He was quiet and trembling. He wasn't fighting the restraints, he almost seemed to feel safer in the back of the ambulance. While I concluded assessing, I got this bone-cold shiver down my spine. I looked out the window and saw this house. Mind you, there are acres between every single house out here. Well, this house was like the others. It looked normal, 
but next to it was this big tree or bush, and in a separate tone and position was this old four-door sedan, parked. The car looked out of place and was clearly separated from the house and the tree and bush. It was like the car was its own place. It was really odd and creepy. I can normally see into the car's cab and see the headrest of the driver's seat from afar, but this car was pitch black on the inside, almost as if the darkness was coming out of the windows because it was the deepest and darkest black I've ever seen. All I saw inside was this deep black and two neon dark blue eyes staring back at me, a little above where a tall and very large man's eyes would be in a car. Immediately I felt the back of the ambulance get colder and there were goosebumps on my skin. At first I thought it was a security light or a reflection in the car. But as we passed the house, the car turned on, pulled out, and started following us in the ambulance. The neon blue eyes were still there, and the cab was still as dark as ever. The car followed us miles to the highway, still with those eyes staring, and the deepest, darkest black in the cab. Even with all the streetlights, I could not see into the car. I was almost mystified by this and nearly forgot about my patient. All I knew was that I did not feel welcomed by these dark blue neon eyes. It was almost threatening and felt as if it wanted my patient. We were on the highway and this car was still following us, over 20 miles now. The neon dark eyes were still there and I still couldn't see into the car. It got colder. I started to feel as if it noticed me watching and was watching and focusing on me now instead of my patient. The car then sped up and pulled up next to the ambulance in the next lane while we were driving and looked directly at me. I was very literally five feet from this car and I could see nothing through the windows. All I could see were those eyes but they weren't looking ahead. They were looking directly at me. In that moment, I said quietly, but out loud, go away. You are not touching this man. This man is my patient. And if you want him, you'll have to come through me. I'm stronger than you and I will not let you have him. After I said that, not even a moment later, the car and my ambulance split off as one went onto one off ramp and the other, I don't know where it went. It was no longer cold in the ambulance and my patient was no longer gray in the cheeks, but now his cheeks were pink and normal. It wasn't until after the call and when we got the patient inside the hospital when I realized what had just happened. I truly feel that Whatever those deep neon blue eyes belonged to was not human and that it wanted that man. I've never believed in the paranormal or demons or spirits or anything that wasn't hardcore science until this. I haven't had an encounter like that again and I hope I never do. I don't know if that man is still alive or what his outcome was, but all I know is what I experienced and saw that night and it was horrifying. In this story, Reddit user Pineapple Juice tells us some strange tales about the house she grew up in. Here's the story. So back when I was about to start second grade, me, my mom, and my sister had to move to the next town over because my sister had gotten into a fight. This was the town my mom grew up in and where my grandparents lived. I don't know why, but my mom kept on choosing the much older houses in the town, like before 1900s old. I personally didn't care until we got to the house. 
I remember the absolute nervousness I felt when I walked into the house. I felt like I was being watched, and I absolutely hated it. When we got to what was going to be my room, I felt decent, I guess. I stayed in there for most of the tour, I believe. Maybe I was taking in my surroundings, but I remember that I liked the walls, and before I left, I waved and said goodbye. I felt as though I had to say it. When we were leaving, we had to drive across the front, and in the second attic, there was a window on every side of the house. There was this girl who was translucent and very old-timey looking. She was gray, but where her eyes were supposed to be were a dark gray, and what I could only assume was blood dripping down her face. Well, once we moved in, I remember that this is where my talking habit I have yet to break comes in. I would just talk and talk for hours. I would explain what I was watching for absolutely no reason, even when nobody was there. Well, one night after we got completely moved in, I decided to knock on the floor. I got a knock back, and I remember that it made me feel not so lonely. This happened until I was a solid 10 years old, and I think that's where everything began to go downhill. That's where everything started. The feeling of being watched intensified. I never felt alone. When I was about nine and in the third grade, I went to sleep at a decent time. I never really had before. I woke up facing away from the door. It was odd, and I felt eyes practically burning into my back. I turned and guess who I saw? The little girl. She couldn't have been much older than me at the time. I remember my fear, how I felt, how her not eyes followed me. Eventually, I got the courage to walk past her and into my sister's room. She told me that I was dreaming and that I should go back to bed. And when I got back to my room, she was gone. But this is when the activity really began. I would see a female and a male shadow person. I brushed it off at first. I thought I was just crazy. So I would just move past it and stop worrying about it. I swear that little girl played with me. Dolls, superheroes, outside, all of it. No matter where I was, no matter how I was playing or what I was playing with, there she was, messing with things, playing alongside. I swear looking back that I could hear a woman's hum sometimes whenever I would try to sleep. We'll get this. My sister's now husband, at the time boyfriend, slept in my room while I was at my grandparents, and he supposedly saw the little girl. And once my sister heard the story, she was like, oh my gosh, my sister wasn't lying. And her boyfriend was like, that is weird. My sister always hated going past my room to the bathroom, but like everything else, we just moved past it. My godbrother, who's about two years older than me, saw a little boy with me that I couldn't see. Well, one time we were joking around with some fake Ouija board on my phone, and it led us to what we called the front room. I kid you not, there was a little boy who was exactly the same as the little girl in our window, who just smiled at us and waved. We got out of there. I remember that any time I felt sad, I knew I wasn't alone. Any time something was wrong, I always felt safe. I felt loved. But I know that right before I left the house, right up until I was gone at 11, maybe 12 years old, I would always stop if I saw a shadow or a figure. I'd go back to where they were and wave a hello before I continued. Before my mom and I moved out, because my sister's a grown woman now, I knocked on the floor one last time, and I got a slight tap. And just then, I said goodbye one last time before we moved out. That house had a lot more things happen to it as well. For instance, the old owner once came by to check it out and ask questions, but nobody remembers the guy before us coming to the house. I remember him vividly. All in all, 
The house I grew up in was very haunted. This story is one that my dad told us when we were younger. I think now, having read a lot of Reddit threads and posts and having done a lot of research, that his story is about a skinwalker. Either way, it's very interesting. This happened in central Wisconsin, when my dad was not even a teenager yet. Wisconsin was even more rural back then, and the area has since become more of a city. But anyway, to the story. My dad and his friend grew up country and always walked the woods and trails and swamplands, etc. Not much else to do, but my dad said that he and his friend were walking a path in one of these spots one day, and this black cat kept following them. Anytime they stopped to look, the cat stopped and looked at them. He said that they tried to use stones, etc., not to hurt it, just to scare it away, but it never got scared. And after a few minutes, they started walking faster, but the cat kept up. Apparently, they both got a very bad feeling, and they decided between themselves to not even look back anymore. As soon as they decided that, they started walking again. That's when they heard this dark, evil laughter. They turned around to see a man in super old school, all black attire, walking away laughing into the brush. So they freaked out, obviously, and ran away. This was the original story, but last year my dad told me something that I didn't know. My grandpa was friends with this other old guy who lived around the area and I guess my dad knew him and would stop by. After this cat thing, my dad came by one time and started telling this story. Apparently, it freaked the guy out really badly. He said that he had been outside doing whatever one day, when all of a sudden this pure black dog came by and just started staring him down and then growling. The guy had a super uneasy feeling and started backing up to his door. Apparently, the moment he turned his back, he rushed in and slammed the door shut. In that instant, the dog had lunged at the door, barking and scratching like crazy for a minute, and then it all went silent. That's when this guy said that he heard this evil laughter and looked out the window to see the same guy that my dad had seen, all black old school clothes from like the 1800s walking away laughing, and then disappearing. My dad swears to this day that he didn't make it up, and he doesn't usually tell anybody. I know he hates me sharing it, because he thinks it's so unbelievable. He doesn't like people ever thinking that he's dishonest, but I believe him. So, I wanted to share his story. from a small town in the middle of Denmark, and my grandfather used to live about 10 kilometers from us. He was what you would roughly translate as a nature caretaker. He lives at the place and gets paid to take care of it. The place that he lived was in a protected area in the forest, just where Denmark's biggest river meets a huge lake. The place had a lot of old buildings, an old paper factory, and a watermill. It used to be run by the monks of the Benedictine order. They built the mill to utilize the water stream to power the machines at the paper factory. The place is basically called the Monastery Mill. Most buildings are from the late 1500s to 1700s, but some of them are from 1100. All the way up until the 1800s, the place was run by the monks. On the other side of the river lived the nuns of the Benedictine order, who were said to have a bad relationship with the monks. 
No one really knows what started this feud. Firstly, it was small. Food would go missing from the monk's stock. Then the water mill would stop and they would realize an insane amount of wood was blocking the water. Lastly, they would wake up to find cattle and chickens had been killed. And one night, the paper factory, which was built entirely of wood, was set on fire. Ever since that day, nobody had seen the monks. Everyone thought that they had left the mill to go somewhere else, as the order had many monasteries across the country. Well, Four years ago, when I had just turned 18, my granddad was going hunting in Sweden. He asked me if I could take care of his place and his dogs for a couple of days. And since I didn't have a car yet, I would just sleep there and take the bus to school in the morning. The place is beautiful, and I was so excited to spend some time there. When I went to sleep the first night, I was woken up at exactly 12 o'clock by what sounded like a small church bell. It rang for a couple of minutes, and then it stopped. A small bell the monks used to use to call mass was just outside my granddad's house, so I assumed that's what I had heard. But when I woke up the next morning and checked out the bell, it was tied tightly, so no wind or person could have made that bell ring. The next night, it happened again. It woke me up at exactly midnight and rang for a couple of minutes. I slowly made my way to the front door, which was made of glass, to look at the bell. And there were my granddad's two dogs, looking out while growling. I swear when I looked out, I saw a bald man wearing a long white dress robe type thing disappearing into the woods almost like he was floating. I called my dad sobbing and asked him to come and pick me up, and he did. We both went back the next day, checked on the bell, and it was still tied up. My dad then confided in me that even though he doesn't believe in that stuff, as he put it, he had had many weird experiences as a kid there, and he still couldn't find any explanation for most of them. Fast forward to last year. My granddad was still living there and the council decided to split the river and make it wider. Had something to do with the forest environment. I didn't really exactly get why. It took weeks for them to plan it out. And then the day came when all the machinery to start the expansion got kicked on. They only got to work for a couple of hours though until they had to stop, because as they were digging, they had found bones. Just a couple, no big deal. But what they soon realized was that by the river, on the monk's side, there was a mass grave. After specialists were called and weeks of digging commenced, they approximated that the grave had about 40 bodies in it, all from the 1800s. At that point, everyone realized that the monks had never left. What happened to them at that paper factory though? No one knows. This happened like eight minutes ago, and I'm pretty confused, so I decided to come and tell my story. Maybe some of you know what's going on. I saw a car pull up in the parking lot. I'm working security. It parked beside my truck, and it was the only car there. At first, I couldn't tell if it was a cop, because it had no lights on the top, and the cameras don't show enough detail to see the writing. It was also an unusual model, definitely not current, but not super old either. Anyway, I went outside to confront the car, because as far as I knew, they were up to no good, and I didn't like them being beside my truck. I go outside and I start walking toward them, but immediately the car drives to the other side of the parking lot and around the building. 
there's no exit that way. I see that it says police on the door. So I go back in to see what they're doing before proceeding. And the car is nowhere to be found. The cameras record everything when movement is detected. So I looked back at that time slot, but the car isn't on the feet at all. I appear in the footage walking out of the building. There's no way that the cameras wouldn't detect a car driving in a huge circle around the lot. And I didn't imagine it. I'm very well rested, very alert, as I work third shift every night, and I slept nine hours before coming in. I'm just very confused about what I saw, and why the cameras couldn't. My grandma used to work at an Aramark factory in Chicago, close to downtown. I don't know the exact address, because I think they changed locations. My grandma's job was to iron the fabric that would come through the machines. One time, she went upstairs to the washroom with her friend. Only two could leave the line at a time. So my grandma was in the stall next to her friend doing their business, when through the cracks, they both see the shadow of a man with a fedora and a long coat, but they didn't see any legs. My grandma didn't know if her friend saw it and her friend didn't know if she had seen it. So they started to wash their hands and they heard a man cough. They hurried to leave, took a long flight of stairs to get to their work area, but never said a word to anybody, not even to each other. At lunchtime, though, they did talk about the event. Comparing notes, they both saw and heard the same thing. So they asked this lady who had worked there for a really long time about it. She said that they heard those stories all the time, that it was either Al Capone or one of his associates. It wasn't that specific warehouse, but around that area was where he would do all of his business, where they would arrange meetings. My mom also worked there, and she said that one time the shift was ending, so all the women tried to be the first to leave. They said that once they got to the main doors, everybody saw a huge black dog, like a Rottweiler, but with a huge collar, and he was just barking and barking. The dog wouldn't stop. They called the boss, and unfortunately, the boss tried to hit the dog with a stick, but it didn't even hurt him. He wouldn't back away at all. Then, finally, on a whim, the dog just ran away. The lady said that they should check the cameras or something because maybe some gangbangers or people up to no good tried to sick the dog on them. The next day, the boss checks the cameras and you can't even see the dog. They see the women by the door you see the boss moving the stick and hitting the air, but there's no dog anywhere. Other times, people would see the dog around the parking lot, but there would be a gate because it was kind of in a bad neighborhood, so he couldn't have jumped or walked in or out. This was in the 90s when it was pretty bad down there, so nobody understands how the dog could have gotten into such a heavily gated property. To this day, though, the weirdest thing is why that dog never showed up on the camera. During my childhood, I had family who lived in Saudi Daisy, near Chattanooga, Tennessee. One of them told me a story of how, as a girl in the 1930s, she had seen the famed Black Track Ghost. When I asked her about it, she told me the story. In the early part of the last century, a beautiful young lady was forced to choose between the pampered life of a well-to-do daughter in Chattanooga and the dirty, boring life at a Saudi Daisy coal mine. She is known as a Black Track Ghost, 
which is so named based on the scattered coal that's found over the train tracks in the area of the mines. The young lady, who was the daughter of a local Chattanooga doctor, decided to marry a handsome clerk at the Saudi Daisy Mining Office. Outraged at the mismatch, the irate doctor disinherited his headstrong daughter. After a few weeks of marriage, though, the young bride apparently grew bored with life with her shantytown clerk and was instead attracted to a rough-and-tumble miner. One night, the mining office was robbed and the clerk was brutally murdered. The unfaithful bride and her miner disappeared and weren't heard from again, at least not in the usual sense. Sometime later, the body of a young, unidentified woman was discovered in a lake in an adjacent county, apparently the victim of murder herself. No connection was ever made to the runaway bride until her image began to plague the Saudi Daisy miners. The first encounter was reported by a hardened coal miner walking home on a bitterly cold winter's night. As the crippled man struggled up the deserted street, he became aware of somebody quickly approaching him on his right. His silent companion, with hair dripping wet and dressed only in a thin white slip, glided past him. Even though he recognized the specter, she stepped by without acknowledging him. The miner was mesmerized, noting that his breath was like a fog in the cold, dark night, while her rigid lips emitted nothing. The black track ghost visits became a common occurrence in Saudi Daisy. When she wore a long, flowing white gown, local residents believed she was just wandering. But if she appeared in her gray slip, which was apparently her death shroud, she foretold doom. If she stood outside somebody's window, a fatal tragedy would befall the unfortunate homeowner. Although the black track ghost is best known in Saudi Daisy, her spirit continued to echo her desire to exist in two worlds. Her father's home was near Walden's, the old Civil War hospital, located near East 8th Street and what is now Martin Luther King Boulevard. The friend that I knew said that she lived in that area as a little girl. The child witnessed the black track ghost many times as she stood and looked sadly into a nearby doctor's home. When the little girl spoke of it, she was slapped and told not to tell lies, but she said that she was only telling the truth. She was just observing the sad shade of a woman who was visiting the comfort and luxury of her father's domain with the knowledge that she could never return home again. Another haunting that went hand in hand with this and occurred simultaneously happened to those living near the coal mining town. They experienced something unique. A pair of glowing eyes would appear in several of the local houses on a fairly regular basis. After a while, nobody was even alarmed. It just became accepted. A young bride got the life scared out of her after waking up to see the ghost roaming her bedroom. Folks just laughed like it was nothing out of the norm. The haunting stopped sometime around the mid 50s though, and nobody's heard from the ghost since and nobody really knows why. My parents got divorced when I was 12, and my mom moved us into a small town in the Pennsylvania mountains. After a few months of living there, I went back to live with my dad in Texas. Ever since, though, I have heard the voices of people I know calling me into the woods. It's been almost eight years now. It's only when I'm alone, but every time I'm alone, and it seems to only happen in Texas. It's weird, but I never even considered that this was maybe something to be concerned about until recently. It was just something that happened. It was almost normal. I even followed the voice once, 
and only thought it was kind of weird that I had heard my dad screaming at me when he hadn't actually called me at all because I got home later and I asked him about it. I don't know if this is related or not, but remembering this is what inspired me to tell this story. A few years ago, I was about a mile out into the woods in Pennsylvania when I kind of zoned out for a minute. I zoned back in and I heard a stick snap. I looked over to see a white tailed doe staring at me from about 10 feet away. It looked almost as though it had been trying to sneak closer to me when I looked at it. I just kind of backed away from it and went back down the mountain. If you're familiar with deer at all, you know this is very strange behavior. Usually, the deer are the ones that run. At the very least, they freeze, but they certainly don't try to sneak up on you. I'm not entirely sure what to make of this now, but looking back on all the times that I just sort of brushed off as normal, I'm starting to think maybe there was nothing normal about it. I live on a 13-acre property in the area of my state where the suburbs turn to rural farmland. My parents live in the main house near our road, while my fiancé and I converted one of the barns on the back half of the property into our house. Our house and another barn are set in a pretty wide clearing and pasture, but beyond that, we are surrounded by woods on three sides. All of this to say, we don't get many visitors out here. From the time we moved into the house almost a year ago, there have been some occasions where I get this inexplicable feeling of terror while outside at night. I've lived in the woods my whole life, including in places far more remote than here, but I have never had this feeling. The woods are my home, and every other place I've ever lived in them they felt like my woods, but not here. I have repeatedly had the feeling that I am trespassing on someone else's land, someone who is not happy to have me here. The other night, I took my dog out for his last walk of the day. So it was pitch black outside of the ring of light cast by the floodlights on the side of the house. As I was walking toward the edge of the tree line, where my pup likes to do his business, I heard a sound, like someone imitating the hoot of an owl, coming from the direction of the other barn, about 30 yards away to our right. I was so certain that it was a human mimicking an owl that I called out, ha ha, very funny, dad. I assumed it was my father closing up the barn for the night, and he was taking an opportunity to try to spook me but no one called back. It was at that point that my dog lifted his head from sniffing all over and froze, staring in the direction of the barn. His hair stood up along his spine and he started to give a low, menacing growl. Now, this dog is obsessed with all people and animals. Everyone is a friend just waiting to be made. I've never seen him act aggressively toward anything, even other dogs that have tried to fight him. My dad, especially, is his favorite person on the planet, so there's no way he would have started growling at him. It was my turn for all the hair on my neck to stand up as a cold wave of fear hit me like a brick wall. My dog had stopped right at the edge of where the light met the darkness of the woods. Normally, the light gradually dissipated into the trees, still providing enough visibility to see the outline of trees and shrubs. But this time, it ended with a solid wall of black. Suddenly, I heard the same fake owl sound from only a few feet away, just on the other side of the darkness. 
My dog jumped and immediately started barking, putting himself between me and the sound. He's only a little guy, so I darted forward, scooped him up, and took off running toward the house. Behind me, I heard the sound again, but this time it had a strange warble to it, almost like somebody was trying to mimic an owl while laughing. The next morning, when I went out to check on the barn, I found the doors had been partially broken off the slide and were swung past each other in the wrong direction, like someone had tried to force them open the wrong way. But there were no signs of anybody, not a footprint, not a cigarette butt, no signs of an intruder at all. I have no idea what was out there that night, but suffice to say, my dog and I stay well within the floodlights when we go out after dark now. About eight years ago, when I was 13, I was up until 3 a.m. playing Xbox online, as you do. I remember feeling a little peckish and I wanted some late night cereal, so I finished my game and went to go grab something to munch on. I turned on the hall lights and checked on my little brother, who was nine at the time, and my little sister, who was five. Being the oldest sibling, it was just something I would do. They were both fast asleep. As I got to the top of the staircase, I started to hear a little girl talking to herself. It completely creeped me out, but I thought maybe it was my sister sleep talking. But then it was even clearer, and I could really hear the sound of this girl's voice, and it was not my sister. I heard the voice coming from downstairs, and I got this horrible, sickening feeling inside my stomach. I got on my knees on the top of the staircase, and put my head down the stairs a little to hear the voice clearer. Then I figured that the voice was coming from the kitchen. Maybe she sensed I was there, because after that, when I tried to hear her even clearer, she laughed and I heard footsteps run off. I absolutely freaked out and ran into my mom and dad's room, telling them what had happened, but they both just told me to go back to bed. Needless to say, I did not get that bowl of cereal or sleep much that night. It was only a few weeks ago, now that I'm 21, that my mom has told me about the little girl who lives in our house. She says she feels her presence every now and then, mainly at the bottom of the stairs, which makes sense, as our two dogs now and our old dog used to stare up the staircase at nothing and sometimes bark like crazy. To this day, when I watch TV, I sometimes feel her looking at me from the stairs, although I've never heard or experienced anything quite like I did when I was younger. I had to do my practice in my school as a librarian for three months. Every morning, I used to sweep and mop the library floor and then start to arrange the books on the shelves. Then I would key in all of the new book entries on the computer. I had the habit of bringing a bottle of holy water with me and I would place it on the table where I sit. Since it was the major exam month, the library would be lonely as the students and the teachers would be going back from school to their houses after one paper that day. Only some students and teachers would come to the library to study and borrow books. Most of the time, though, I would be alone in the library, so I would play some music as I arranged the books on the shelves. One day, as I was taking the log books out from the drawer, I accidentally spilled some holy water on the floor. To my shock, that area started to smoke a little. Although it was hard to see with the naked eye, I sensed that something was amiss in the library that day. As soon as I got up, in shock, the media room doorknob behind me started to twist and turn frantically. I stood in my place and looked over the counter to check if someone was there. 
I saw a shadow at the bottom of the door. I rushed out of the library and walked over to the media room, which was just next door to the library, and turned the doorknob slowly. It was locked. No one could have been in there. So whose shadow did I see? First off, I just want to say that this has been ongoing for years. We were literally 13 to 14 years old when stuff started going down. I'm 18 now, and I have a lot more common sense, or I would like to think so. So please try and look at this from a 13-year-old's perspective, and try not to judge our actions too harshly. Also, this gives more context to the adults in our lives not believing us. I have ridden horses all my life, but have never kept them close to home. When the opportunity came to keep them five minutes down the road from my house and with my best friend's ponies, I was over the moon. Little did I know what was to take place over the following years. I will start this with a backstory. The horse I owned at the time came from a rescue that I volunteered at for five years. I was sitting down one day drinking a cup of tea with the owner of the rescue center, as we usually did after a hard day of mucking out fields and dragging barrels of hay to the 40 horses and donkeys that lived there, when she told me about a farm that was just down the road from my house in a little village that we'll call Trophy. She said that her father had built that farm and that he'd be turning in his grave if he found out who owns it now. Immediately, I was intrigued, so I pushed for more info. She told me that the man who owns it now is Elliot, who's a pig farmer. He murdered his brother-in-law, who was asking him to pay back 150000 in debt. Apparently, he ground him up in a meat grinder and fed him to the pigs. He then moved those pigs two to three hours away for long enough so that when the police eventually tracked them down, any DNA would have been long out of their system. He was actually charged for murder, but ended up being acquitted by the judge due to lack of evidence. What's ironic is that he moved those pigs without a moving permit, which is illegal and suspicious as hell because moving permits are not that hard to get a hold of. So in the end, he got punished for the illegal transport of livestock and not for murder. She told me that although he was eventually found not guilty, Everyone in the village knew that he did it. Now that we've got that out of the way, we'll go back to the farm that I would be keeping my horses at. I had known the owners for a while, as I used to ride one of Annie's horses, my best friend that I mentioned earlier. Nothing particularly scary happened while I was riding for her, except once. We had decided to ride down a different trail that day, one that went past an unfamiliar farm. We didn't know who owned it, and we weren't sure if they were friendly, so we proceeded with caution. All seemed fine as we were riding through the fields, until the path came to a stop. There were gates and guard dogs in the way. We assumed we must have taken a wrong turn, so instead of passing through the gates, we decided to carry on through the fields and around the outskirts of the farm. Unknowingly, we were now trespassing. The horses started to feel extremely uneasy beneath us. Mine would stop and shoot forward. Annie's started backing up into the brook that ran alongside us. Annie was hanging off hers, deciding whether to throw herself off before they both ended up in the ditch when I looked toward the farm. A man was stood completely still staring at us. I honestly thought he was a scarecrow at first and I had no idea how long he'd been there. He disappeared after about 30 seconds of making eye contact with me. For some reason, it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. There was something so unsettling about him. A few minutes later, we finally got the horses under control. That's when we heard gunshots behind us. Guns are illegal in my country. Only licensed owners can have them. The only reasonable explanation was that somebody was scaring birds off their crops, 
were shooting bunnies and they hadn't seen us coming. We went into a flat out gallop. We were terrified because if they really didn't know we were there, we could have been caught by a stray bullet. All the while we were looking back to see if any birds flew to confirm our theory. They never did. That shot was meant for us, to warn us to stay away. Later that night, we looked back at the map to see where our wrong turn had been. The gates were where the trail carries on, but who in their right mind would go past a bunch of snarling guard dogs? At any point, that man could have redirected us. Shooting toward us was pretty psychopathic. We didn't tell anyone that day, as we thought we would get in trouble for trespassing. But that's only where the problems began. When I brought Eric to the farm, things calmed down. There were odd scenarios that played out. Sheep were stolen, our ponies were let out, and a white pickup truck would be seen prowling the area often. But again, nothing too serious. That was until October of that year, when we would end up riding in the dark as the days were shorter in the winter. This particular evening, we were just goofing around and laughing, like 14-year-olds do, when we heard an owl hooting. It was coming from one of the fields that the scary farmer owned. I began imitating it, joking around, and not really expecting a reply, but it did reply. I found this hilarious, and Annie began joining in. This carried on for about five minutes, which in hindsight, was definitely a red flag. Any owl would have stopped replying within the first two or three calls, realizing that it wasn't speaking to one of its own. This one always replied and sounded louder every few calls. The longer this went on, the less owl-like this thing sounded. There was a moment where the noise almost sounded strangled. And that was when Annie turned to me and said, that is not an owl we realized that we had just led whoever was in that field right to us. They could now pinpoint exactly where we were. We turned our flashlights off and ducked, trying to be quiet, which is difficult when you have a 1200 pound animal squishing through the mud underneath you. We decided screw it and we galloped the rest of the field back to the farm. What we didn't realize was that the weight of the horses had left deep hoof marks in the soil, leading straight back to us. We were freaking out as we got back, but the adrenaline began to wear off and we ended up laughing about it while untacking the horses. We were about to lead them to the field when we heard the crunch of broken glass being stepped on from one of the old greenhouses opposite the stables. It was pitch black except for the dull light coming from behind us so we couldn't see anything. Immediately, we turned all the lights off, picked up a pocket knife that we used to cut hay bags open with, and hid behind the stable door. We waited for 10 minutes with no phone signal to call the police, but didn't hear a thing, scared to even breathe in case it made too loud of a sound. I decided to be brave and make a dash for the horses who were tied up outside thinking that if I could jump onto one, I could get out of there quicker than whoever I might see. My eyes had adjusted to the darkness, so I could kind of see into the greenhouse. I shouted back to Annie, there's no one here, we're just being paranoid. Again, we laughed it off, trying to shake the terror that we had just experienced. It was only the next day that it became very, very real. The next morning was hot. The ground had baked and preserved the hoof prints we left from the previous night. However, there was something else in between them. Massive boot prints leading from the field we had heard the owl in all the way back to our farm. That was where the nickname Farmer Bigfoot came about. We told our parents, but they decided that we were just making drama out of paranoia and didn't believe us. And that was that. These boot prints started appearing a lot. We would skate on the ice where the fields flooded over in the winter. We noticed the prints a few times, stopping on the edge of the field where we would skate and then continuing in the opposite direction. We didn't ever see anyone watching us though. I lost Annie's phone in the fields one night 
we went looking for them in the dark. The next morning, footprints. Farmer Bigfoot footprints. Our trail started getting blocked off. First, a huge tree. I'm talking a couple hundred years worth of trunk and branches was brought down onto our trail. It was then set on fire after we cut ourselves a path through it. When we weren't being deterred, they seemed to give up. Until 2018, when huge mounds of rubble started being dumped on our trail. This time, the trail was basically inaccessible. We spoke to a man who lives on the corner, who told us that he didn't want to name the farmer who was behind all of this, but that we should report it as it is illegally blocking a bridle path. We tried to report it, but the council won't go near him because he's too scary of a man. This guy told us that we were being watched and to be careful. Now this freaked us out. But us being stupid kids, we stayed from 5 p.m. till 9 p.m. clearing a path through the rubble. We also wrote F.U. in stones just for effect. The next day, there were three more piles of rubble and our path was covered over. We were at a loss, so we decided to talk to one of the neighboring farms that keeps horses. Without telling us a name, she said, you have to be careful messing with him. Around here, he's known as the man who makes people disappear. And that's when it clicked. This whole time, we'd been messing with Elliot. Farmer Bigfoot was Elliot. The same Elliot who fed his brother-in-law to the pigs. No wonder the council wouldn't go near him. Again, we tried to tell our family, but nothing came of it because they thought we were just being dramatic. Things continued happening. Bones were left on top of the rubble piles. Again, I'm guessing this was to scare us. A whole herd of sheep were stolen. The horses kept being let out. The owners of our farm would never say who they suspected, but we all knew who it was. The white pickup would turn up almost every week. We started leaving breadcrumbs on our Snapchat stories, thinking if it was weird enough for people to screenshot, we'd have multiple witnesses if anything happened to us. We told friends that if we disappeared, make the police look at Elliot. We were terrified. It quieted down after a while, until September of last year. We had just ridden, and I was leading both horses back to the field on my own. It's down a dirt track about a two minute walk from the stables. I walked through the wooded area on the track, and immediately this smell hit me. It was vile, and I knew what it was immediately. Death. Literal rotting flesh. It was enough to make you gag. I put the horses out and immediately ran back to Annie to come and investigate with me. The farm owner, we'll call him Ryan, overheard me and went into the house to grab a flashlight. Annie has a weak stomach, so as soon as the smell hit her, she threw up. It was so strong and so disgusting. Ryan soon joined us and said, someone has definitely been in here. That just added to our fear. Annie had recovered from her vomiting fiasco and rejoined us in a search. Ryan then said, I really don't know what we're going to find out here, girls, but I don't think it's going to be an animal. Our fear meter was now at the max, but morbid curiosity drove us forward. After an hour of searching, we decided to unstack a pile of wooden pallets. And that's when we saw bags of white flesh. They were clear Ziploc bags. Maggots crawled inside the bags, but there were no holes, implying that whatever meat was in there had been rotting for a good while before it was cut up and put in the bags. It was the most surreal experience. After more vomit from Annie, we decided to call it a day, reassured that Ryan would now deal with whatever the hell this was. We assumed that he would have called the police. We got home and cried to our parents, but again, they dismissed it. How the hell are we being dramatic when we just found chunks of rotting flesh in the woods? Anyway, Brian is hands down one of the loveliest men on the planet. We always felt safe around him. But what we found out days later 
was extremely questionable. He didn't call the police. He buried the meat. He didn't throw it out. He buried it. What the fuck? We assume now that it's because he's old and vulnerable and he didn't want to get involved in anything that might put him or his family at risk. I still have no idea why Annie and I didn't phone the police. I'm guessing because we didn't want to cause trouble for Ryan. And no one else believed us, so why would the police? This is, unfortunately, I guess, where my story concludes. I know, how unsatisfying. I'm no longer at the farm, but I still have horses. My parents now believe everything I told them. I think maybe because I've kept telling them for the past five years. In hindsight, they wonder why the hell they didn't move the horses out of there. Annie and I are still best friends, and we reminisce from time to time about how we were stalked by a murdering farmer for nearly three years. We will never know what that meat was, or if Elliot had anything to do with it, nor will we know why he followed us all those years, trying to stop us from riding down our very own bridal path. But honestly, I'm not sure I want to know. I thought this might be a good place to discuss the strange goings-on in my woods with a larger audience. I'd like to preface this by saying that I am highly educated and scientific. I have never been a believer in the supernatural, Bigfoot, or things of that nature. That being said, I'm at a loss for the things my family has encountered on my property over the last seven years, and I would love to hear your suggestions. Here's my story. Seven years ago, my wife and I purchased a property and 11 acres of woods in a rural part of northeastern Minnesota. The woods were connected to larger acreage, fields and woods, of about 160 acres. And although sparsely populated, the land is near a fairly busy state highway. There are some housing developments in the area but they're three to four miles away, and the majority of the land all around our property is farm, fields, woods, and rivers. It's remote, but with towns so close that I wouldn't call it wild by any means. I'm mentioning this because I've heard many Native American legends of things in the deep northern woods of Minnesota and Canada, but the area in which we live is not that. Rural, yes, but not the endless north woods. As I said earlier, I'm not a believer in the supernatural, and I've never been afraid of the woods or the outdoors, even though I have a healthy sense of caution and respect for large bears, moose, wolves, other potentially dangerous wildlife. I'm also an avid hunter and mountaineer, and I've experienced many nights in the wilderness. I've had numerous encounters with dangerous animals and situations, so I'm not easily spooked. Knowing my state of mind is important to the story, because many so-called supernatural encounters can be explained by people with an already high level of belief, anxiety, or fear. But that's not me. Well, that all changed after the first few weeks of moving in. The house and land had been abandoned for a couple of years due to foreclosure, so a lot of work needed to be done to get it back into shape. Wildlife had grown accustomed to no human presence, and Black Bear frequently roamed the yard at night, along with many other woodland creatures. We also found a lot of animal bones scattered throughout the woods, and coyotes were abundant. One night during those first few weeks, we had a rainstorm and I was worried about a broken downspout, potentially causing a basement leak. It was about 10 p.m., so I grabbed my headlamp and headed outside to deal with the situation. Behind our house is a fairly large swampy area that divides the woods. I had my back facing this area while fiddling with the downspout, when suddenly I had this intense feeling of dread. It's really hard to explain, 
It was like my body knew that something was back there. It was very unusual based on the circumstances. Never having felt this type of fear before, I tried to stay calm and slowly I turned around to point my headlamp back toward the swamp. What I saw was something I still can't explain. Eyes. Numerous glowing reflecting eyes staring back at me. These were not eye reflections that you would typically see with a deer or other animal since they were at different heights. And when I pointed my headlamp spot beam directly at where you would expect a head to be, there was nothing there but weeds and trees. When I turned the headlamp off, they were still there and glowing as if a light was being shined. They did not move. They just stared through me. Needless to say, I bolted and ran as fast as I could back into the house and explained it away as deer or raccoons, even though I knew it couldn't really be either. Later that summer, I was sitting out on our screened-in porch that partially faces the swamp and connected woods to the west. It was approximately 11 p.m., when I began to hear what sounded like a bear fighting with or attacking a cow. Since there was a small farm to the southwest of my property, I assumed that perhaps a cow had wandered into the woods and been attacked by a bear. I really didn't know if this was something a bear would actually do, but it was my only guess based on the sounds I was hearing at the time. It was clearly some kind of roar, like a bear, but then followed by a frantic sounding cow mooing thing. This went on for over an hour and it was perhaps one of the most horrible sounds I have ever heard. Even though it sounded so strange and almost supernatural, it didn't frighten me since I had this rational explanation in my head. Even weirder, this same series of sounds happened again the next summer. These first few years, I never really investigated the area of the woods that the sounds came from, since it wasn't my property. A couple of years later, I had the chance to purchase this area and 70 acres to the west, which consisted of the woods that connected to mine, as well as a few tilled fields, more woods, and ponds. As part of purchasing this land, I spent a great deal of time walking around on it to get a good understanding of its value and layout. As part of my walk, I was able to get a much better look at the farm set up to the south. The farm did have cows, as I suspected, but to my surprise, the area that they were kept in was a long distance from my house, much too far for me to hear them, and the fencing was also extremely well built and electrified. Looking at it, there was just no way a cow was wandering off from that farm. I didn't really think about this fact until recently. After acquiring the property, I proceeded to put up tree stands at various locations along with trail cams in order to prep for the upcoming deer hunting season. One spot was the hilly woods where I heard those sounds many years prior. Again, I did not connect these two things until now. The area was very odd, as whenever I hiked through there, I always saw some new strange thing. One time, my son and I found an old game snare tied to a tree, with what looked to be dried blood on the tree bark. Another time, we found at least a hundred-year-old tree, with a barbed wire fence completely spiraling the entire trunk growing in and out of it at different intervals. I've also found many tree trunks with very large scratches or claw marks, not resembling an antler rub. Perhaps a bear? We'd almost always find dead animal bones in this area. And even this winter, I found a couple of deer legs snapped and picked clean. My sons have found numerous animal skulls there as well. As I was saying, I put a game camera in this area since I had seen tracks and sign and I wanted to get a sense of the best places to hunt. I've placed one there many seasons and have yet to capture a single thing on it. Nothing. 
My son has posted there a couple of times for hunting season and has mentioned the strange sense of quiet. He's used to the forest sounds coming back after sitting still for long periods of time. But in this spot, there are never any sounds. He has mentioned hearing something walking around though. Another incident occurred one hunting season when I was entering this area en route to another stand when I saw a violent thrashing in the foliage moving fast and crossing from right to left, but moving away from my position. I, of course, encounter deer and bear all the time, so I'm familiar with how they move when they're spooked. But this was something different. Whatever this thing was made a high-pitched trumpeting combined with a bellowing sound that was like nothing I had ever heard from an animal outside of an elk, which we don't have in this area. It wasn't bounding, and there wasn't the raised white tail or large dark mass to indicate a deer or bear. There really didn't appear to be a body at all, just whipping and falling leaves and branches along with the deafening sounds. A year after this incident, my son went out hiking in the woods to try to find me since I was out doing some forest management. As he walked through this area, he thought he spotted me coming through the woods, fast, but quickly noticed that the walk and clothing were nothing like mine. Whoever it was was also a lot taller than me, and he described him as extremely thin. He said the person he saw didn't notice him at all, and seemed to be walking in a straight line, like they had tunnel vision. Seeing someone in this part of the woods and their direction of travel didn't make sense at all. There really wouldn't be a reason to be there, or to be headed that way, as it leads to deep ravines and an uncrossable river. After he found me and explained what he saw, I quickly went over to investigate to see if we had a trespasser. I hiked for quite a while, but I never found anything or anyone. If someone was there, they either got picked up on the road or vanished. That same year, my son had a friend over and they went for a late afternoon walk in the woods. As it began to get dark, they made their way back by walking on the edge of the field that's next to this area of the woods. As they passed, they said that they saw a figure a little ways off in the trees. Whatever it was, it was near one of the hills in this patch of forest, and it seemed to be making some kind of hand gestures. It began walking slowly toward them. When they called out, Hey, hello? He, or it, stopped still and said nothing. It was at this point the boy sensed something wasn't right and bolted back toward the house. They rushed into the house and told me what they saw. I, of course, laughed it off as their mind playing tricks on them. My son described the figure as very tall, like 10 to 15 feet, but with skinny arms, and his body was dark all over. Not hairy, per se, but dark. They even thought it was an animal at first because of the weird way that it looked. He couldn't really describe it very well, other than gaunt or skinny and strangely dark. Me being the curious and protective father I am, was worried about it being trespassers or druggies or something, so I told them I would go take a look. They brought me to the area and pointed to where it was standing, and I headed into the woods. Since it was winter and there was snow on the ground, I thought it would be quite easy to locate the tracks of whatever this was and find out where it came from or where it went to. When I got to the spot, there wasn't a single track or disturbance in the snow. There was no way an animal or a man could have been in that area and not left tracks. They had either made it up or their minds had played tricks on them, or so I thought. To this day, my son and his friend still swear that they saw it clear as day and I can definitely attest that their fright was real. My wife has also experienced strange thrashing sounds and other feelings of dread or being watched in this part of the woods and generally refuses to go over there anymore. 
All of this brings me to today, where I had a sudden realization that all of the strange sounds, sightings, bones, and events seemed to all be centered around this one area. I am just at a complete loss as to what it all means. It's all too strange to really bring this up and discuss it with people I know around here, but I wanted to share my story and see if anybody in this community might have any theories or ideas on what we might be dealing with here. I'll continue to investigate on my end, but I would love to know what you think. When I was around 11 years old, we lived in a log cabin in the woods of Dedham, Maine. Though there were other houses nearby, we seldom crossed paths with our neighbors. The cabin, which was approximately 250 miles from our primary residence, had been purchased recently by my father, and we had already spent a few nights there. On this occasion, we had planned to stay for an extended weekend. Given the cabin's age, my parents had decided to have some renovations done to enhance its charm. This meant that several rooms were under construction, leaving us with just one bedroom to accommodate all six of us, my parents, my two brothers, my sister, and me. The night had set in, and we were all tucked in the solitary bedroom. Suddenly, in the middle of the night, I was jolted awake by the distinct sound of boot steps in the living room, an old wooden door on a rickety deadbolt block, likely to fall apart under a strong impact, were all that separated us from the living room. As I was still shaking off the sleep, I heard my sister's voice asking if anyone else could hear the sound. That's when I realized it wasn't a dream. It was all too real. I quickly sat up to find my parents and my sister staring anxiously at the door. My heart started racing, unable to make sense of what was happening. My sister's fear-filled question, are we going to die, sent a chill down my spine. The boot steps paused briefly as my other brother began to wake up, but then they resumed. There was no fading implying the source of the sound was stationary. A sense of fear and worry pervaded the room as we tried to understand how someone could have entered our locked cabin. As my last brother woke up, the boot step ceased altogether. In response, my father retrieved the machete he had kept under the bed, cautiously approached the door, and listened for any other sounds. Then, with one swift move, he unlocked the door, flung it open, and brandished his weapon, ready for an intruder. He checked the living room and the other rooms, only to find everything undisturbed. All the doors and windows were still locked, and nothing seemed to have been tampered with. Getting back to sleep that night was a struggle. In the morning, the memory of the previous night's events still haunted me. Those crystal clear bootsteps were real, a fact confirmed by my family, leading me to believe that we had had a paranormal encounter. Despite our attempts to explain the event rationally, we have yet to find a plausible explanation. And one thing I'm sure of, those bootsteps originated from inside the house. This remains one of the most frightening experiences of my life. If you have any logical explanation for this, please let us know. I'm really just telling this story as a way to vent because I'm in a situation where I really just feel stuck. I've tried just about everything, so I guess I'm just gonna start from the beginning. This story is two years in the making, so I'll try to be as thorough as possible. 
In 2019, I graduated with my master's degree and moved to a relatively rural area for my PhD. Thinking we'd make an investment, my dad and I purchased a house. The intent was to rent it out once I completed my PhD. This house was only a block away from a dive bar where my dad was able to make some pretty good friends. He introduced me to everyone and everyone let me know that I would be so happy in my new house because my next door neighbor was the absolute nicest guy you could ever meet. So we met the neighbor and he did seem nice enough. He suggested that we exchange numbers just in case I ever needed anything. And I thought that was a good idea. What's the worst that could happen? A few days later, my dad left to go back to his home in another state and I was left to my own devices. Literally the day after he left, it started. My neighbor texted me while I was away and let me know that he left a gift for me on my front porch. In this text exchange, he started using pet names like Sweetie and Cutie. I went home and he had left a hand-painted feeding dish for my cats in my mailbox. At this point, I wasn't that alarmed. He was just being nice, I thought. The next day, he sent me more texts with pet names, and I took the opportunity to make sure he knew that I was not interested in anything romantic. He replied back with a rambling text about how all a person ever needs is friends and he would just like to be friends with me. After that, he would send me texts frequently, everything from inviting me fishing to telling me that he left more gifts on my porch. I would often not reply, or I would tell him that I was busy. I didn't want to be rude, but I also had no interest in any sort of relationship with him other than being neighborly. One night, I got a text from the manager of the bar down the street, letting me know that if my neighbor knocked on my door, I shouldn't answer. She then told me that my neighbor had walked down to the bar with a hatchet and told the bartender he was hearing voices that got louder as he got closer to the bar. He threatened to kill someone with the hatchet if the voices didn't stop. They called the police and the police took the hatchet from him but made no arrest. The manager of the bar picked me up and I spent the night at her house. She told me that the police said my neighbor was heavy into meth. After that, I tried to keep my distance even more, but things got weirder. One day I went out to my car and I found a dead squirrel in my driveway. The squirrel had very clearly been run over and moved to right in front of my driver's side door. I just stepped over it, got in my car, and left. When I returned home, the squirrel was gone. Shortly after, I received a text from my neighbor that said, Someone or something put a dead squirrel in your driveway. Don't worry, I moved it for you. I felt like this was a weird way to word this, and I suspect he's the one who put the squirrel in the driveway. Another time, I walked out of my house to see that he had placed an unspent shotgun shell on the bricks in front of his yard. He came out and told me that it was to serve as a warning for anyone walking between our houses. For the next couple of months, I did my best to avoid him. He would text me inviting me over and I would come up with an excuse or just ignore him completely. I wanted to remain cordial since he was my neighbor but it was getting very annoying and I was uncomfortable. He would text me as soon as I got home, telling me that he was watching me come and go from my house. On Halloween, he handcrafted a large casket and wrote, here lies the last son of a bitch who played mind games, November, 2012. I mean, what the hell, right? All this time, he's still sending me texts Eventually, I got really fed up and I just stopped responding completely. Less than two weeks after I stopped responding, he threw a 50 pound flower pot at my front door. You know, those big concrete planters? Yeah, one of those. I called the police who advised me to get a stalking no contact order. A few days later, I was watching TV when a notification popped up that my neighbor was trying to cast a video to my screen. I declined it, twice. I filed another report with the police. During this time, I started the process of getting a stalking no contact order. I saw three different victim advocates who all told me different things. I went out of town for a conference 
and during that time, someone had attempted to break into my home. I had an ADT security system, so while they didn't succeed, I was aware of the attempt. After the conference, I came home to the entire world shutting down because of the pandemic. I was trapped in my home 24 seven with my stalker neighbor next door. Luckily, court proceedings for protection orders didn't stop. Right before court, he sent me a text telling me that he was sorry for what he'd done, that he could tell when he saw me outside that he made me uncomfortable. Then he went on to tell me that he could tell my hair had gotten longer and I looked beautiful. I went to court and provided all of the evidence I had, the timeline of everything that had ever happened, the texts he'd sent me asking if I wanted a massage, the texts I sent him telling him that the way he was speaking to me was inappropriate, the text saying he knew he made me uncomfortable. I told the judge that I suspected he had attempted to break into my house while I was out of town. The kicker is he didn't deny any of it. Actually, he told the judge that he took full accountability for everything. He said he was in recovery and was trying to turn over a new leaf. He didn't oppose to the protection order at all. So in March of 2020, I actually received the stalking no contact order. Everything was pretty quiet for a while. I mean, he did some weird things, but that's because he's a weird guy. It wasn't anything that made me fear for my safety. That is until he started using again. At this time, we found an unspent shotgun casing in my flower bed. It was consistent with the one he had previously used to send a warning. This occurred a couple of months after I started dating my boyfriend, and I suspect it was a warning to him. After this, and for a variety of reasons, my boyfriend moved in with me. He moved in pretty quickly, but everything turned out fine. We're still together and happy as can be in our relationship. New Year's 2021, I was awoken to yelling. I turned on my security cameras and I got footage of him sticking his head out his window, screaming obscenities at my bedroom window for seven full minutes. It doesn't sound like a long time, but when your stalker is screaming threats and obscenities, seven minutes is a lifetime. He called me a harlot. He said, happy effing new year. He said he was going to blow up his house with his gas line. I called the police who responded. They told me that because he never said my name, they can't prove it was a violation of the protection order. The officer said, and I quote, there's nothing illegal about yelling in your own house they left without even speaking to him. All I could do at this point was do my best to avoid him. I parked on the street because my driveway is pretty close to his front porch. I got used to living with my curtains drawn. I always made sure my cameras were charged, all five of them. Yes, because of him, I spent over a thousand dollars on cameras. Every inch of my yard is covered. Since then, he's been seen by me and by other neighbors talking to people who aren't even there going outside and screaming nonsense. Things like, I have Cheerios on my necklace and other things. I'm not even joking. This basically brings me to last week. In the morning, I was getting ready for the day when I heard screaming. Someone is gonna die over this sweatshirt. I turned on the cameras. I got footage of him walking around the alley behind my house screaming. Are you effing proud? How about I get my shotgun? I'll get everyone all fired up. I call the police. Once again, they didn't charge him with a violation of the protection order. Instead, they gave him an ordinance violation for disturbing the peace. The police told me that it seemed like he's off his meds again, and that was that. They left. Last night, I was awoken to hammering outside my window at 1 a.m. He was cutting down his privacy fence horizontally. I called the police for a noise complaint and they just told him to stop. As I write this, he is outside continuing to horizontally cut down his privacy fence. That means the privacy fence only stands about three feet tall now. This was the one thing that made me feel relatively safe about hanging out in my own backyard and now that's gone. All of this to say, I'm freaking tired. I just want to live in a house where I can be sure that my neighbor won't try to kill me, where I can feel confident that he's not going to try to break in. 
My boyfriend and I are trying to buy a house and to move, but it's difficult. I'm a PhD student, so I don't make very much money. Renting won't work because I have four cats. Plus my partner's cat and dog, although we have a place secured for them if necessary. And finding a place to rent with so many animals is difficult, if not impossible. I refuse to rehome them. So maybe it's partially my fault that I'm stuck in this situation. My dad has agreed to co-sign on another mortgage and I've gotten a second job. We should be able to save up enough money within a few months, but until then, I'm stuck. I just don't know what else to do. I'm tired, I'm angry, so I figured I would tell this story to vent. This isn't even everything that happened. It's just something to give you an idea of what's been going on. I'm just so exhausted. This story happened three years ago when I was 15. It happened in my village. I don't tell this story much because people tend to think that I'm making it up, but I've been thinking of it quite a lot this week and I just wanted to share it. My village is located in a rural area that is protected by the government because it has been considered a natural paradise for the last 30 years. This means that exploration in this area is quite difficult nowadays since it is forbidden to cut trees, which means that it is a huge forest. I was spending my summer there and my favorite thing was to go hiking, although I had never gone into the woods alone, just on roads with people. My grandma had told me the cleaning services had opened and rehabilitated a path that had been covered in bushes and trees for the last 30 years because of a race that was being prepared, like runners and stuff. Usually I'd go to the nearest town about an hour away on foot by the only way that I knew, the road. On my way back from seeing friends there, I took the new path that my granny told me was safe. I went alone. That was a mistake. The first part of the path was the easiest, just too many obstacles and landslides, but it was nothing compared to the rest. The second part was a hill full of rocks that was the hardest thing to go up. Literally, I had to climb up on my arms and legs like a dog. When I got to the top, I looked around and found some animal bones. I didn't pay much attention to it since the area is known for its big population of wolves and bears that go out at night. I continued my way faster than before. This part was plain floor, where the woods really begin. So it was a relief when I got to a dead end. Some huge trees had fallen exactly on a row on the path, and it was impossible to cross them. This seemed really off to me, because there were no other fallen trees. The weirdest part? Beside those trees, there was this little barn. Yes, a barn in the middle of the woods. I thought to myself that it was probably abandoned. It looked like it. So I decided to throw my bag into the little field that belonged to the barn, and I crossed the fence. I crossed it running without realizing the most bizarre thing. The field had no trees. It was clear. No bushes, no big plants, nothing. It really shouldn't be like that if it was abandoned. And nobody had been able to cut anything down there for years. I started feeling concerned about how the location of the fallen trees was so coincidental how there casually was this barn beside a clear field when the path had been closed for 30 years. It just seemed really off. I went on and luckily I was reaching the last hill that my grandma had described, the one that connected with the village. Suddenly there was a moment of silence in the woods, absolute silence, which allowed me to hear some branches cracking behind me. I thought to myself it was probably a bird or something, but they came closer and they sounded like footsteps. After trying to convince myself it was probably just an animal, I was way too afraid to look back. I started walking faster and guess what? So did the footsteps. I just took off running after I noticed that and so did the footsteps. At this point, I was running for my life 
Suddenly, I started to hear incredibly loud grunts. Everything was going really fast. Luckily, I got to my village in a minute or so after that. I got onto the patio of the first house I found and closed the door. It was a relative's house, no need to call the police. I stayed there for 10 minutes until I got my breath back, and then I went home. I get chills just from remembering the place, not having a signal in the middle of nowhere. And the grunts. It makes me think there was something following me since the barn and the trees were just a distraction to slow me down. I never went into the woods alone after that. I'm a carer and I have been for about five or six years. I prefer to work nights as it's a calmer working experience. I've seen and heard many strange things, but two stick out and I thought I'd tell you about it. The first one. I was on shift one night and every hour we have to do checks on the residents to make sure that they're okay and still with us. So I'm doing my checks and everything is going okay until I get to the last room. This lady likes her door closed at night, so the light in the corridor doesn't wake her up. And I go to open her door, but I couldn't move it. It was as if someone was pushing it shut from the other side. I tried two or three times to open it, and it just won't budge. Fearing that the lady has fallen behind it, I go to get the nurse on shift and my colleagues. Each of us try to open the door, but it won't move. After 20 minutes or so, the door opens easily, as it should do, and the lady was asleep in bed, snoring away, and there's nothing there to have kept the door closed. I should mention that this was in a part of the building that no one likes to be alone in, as it always feels like you're being watched. On a couple of occasions, a shadow has been seen in some of the rooms. The second, I came in on shift and found out that one of the residents had passed away just 30 minutes before the night staff got there. We were waiting for the undertakers to come and collect the body. It could be up to two hours before they got there. As we were going about our job, the buzzer went off in that room. I went and switched it off and left the room. His buzzer went off every 10 minutes until the undertakers arrived and none of us could ever explain why or how it was doing that. This is a description of events that happened to me during my time as a security guard at a local factory. Obviously, I can't give any locations or names, but I will say that it happened in Germany. I have been working at this place for about two years. It's an old chemical factory that was built in the early 1900s before World War I. I don't know much more about its history other than that, though. For the first few months, all went pretty smoothly, but after a while, I started noticing some things that were quite odd. The first thing I noticed on my nightly rounds was that in some buildings, the lights seemed to turn on or off on their own. But I wrote that off as the old electrical installations, which could act quirky sometimes, or employees forgetting to turn the light off. Employees could act quirky too. The thing is, that stuff kept happening, even when there was nobody else but me on the premises. I could check a building at the start of my round, only to return 30 minutes later, to find every light in the building turned on, but the doors still locked. There was one particular building that constantly gave me the creeps. A flat, one-story building that was basically one long hallway, with office rooms on either side. Every time I walked through that hallway to check if all the offices were locked, I felt like somebody was just behind me, looking over my shoulder. 
It was also in this building that I heard whispers or sighs from one of the offices, but they were always empty, and all of the electronic equipment that could have caused those noises were turned off or in some cases unplugged. Another building that I had weird stuff happen in was the metal workshop. The weirdest thing was that one night I heard a noise from within and when I entered all of the machines, the drills, the saws, everything were on and running. I just ran in, hit the main emergency switch and got out of there. That night, again, I was the only one there. I tried to talk with some of my colleagues about it, but they said that if I wanted to keep my job, I'd better stop talking about these things, as management didn't take too kindly to people asking questions. So, I haven't asked any more questions, but I definitely have some. This may be a ramble of thoughts, but after recently hearing about missing 411 and the like, I finally felt like I could offer something that my family and I experienced a few years ago that to this day gives me a shiver. Hopefully you enjoy this story. I've been camping, solo backpacking, and hunting my whole life in Oregon and felt comfortable in the woods, and I have a deep respect for nature. A few years ago, my wife, daughter, and two German shepherds went camping north of Mount Jefferson, Oregon. We found our campsite to be the perfect setup for us and our two dogs, who need the privacy, since they're intimidating to other dog owners and can be loud when spooked. It wasn't an established campsite, just a nice horseshoe off of a U.S. Forest Service road that had flat ground, full trees, and a fire pit. The first night, my daughter wanted to sleep by herself in a two-man tent right next to ours. It was maybe two feet away from my wife and I's tent. We made the male German Shepherd sleep with her in her tent. His name is Guts. That whole first night, neither my wife or I could sleep. We both heard footsteps, and they were heavy. Not like typical forest critters scampering around in the night. I was well armed because I was paranoid from having read recently before departing about a dad in California who was shot and killed in a tent next to his two infant daughters. Needless to say, both my wife and I had two pistols and I had my rifle with me. The dogs are great at detection and that's why I felt my daughter could sleep alone because Guts is completely fearless and nothing would lay a hand on her without a battle to the death. All in all, nothing but bad vibes and loud footsteps occurred that night, which I ultimately decided had to be a deer or maybe some elk. Day two, morning. We go for a walk down the road and maybe 300 feet away, we see this circle area. I see this abandoned road where a rusted gate post was covered in vegetation. The gate was missing. Something of a blue color caught my eye, and Guts immediately takes off running down this abandoned road. My heart begins to race, because I think if it's another family camping like us, he's going to get himself shot or scare some innocent people to death. So I chase after him as fast as I can, and the rest of the family follow. He stops after 20 feet into the road, and me yelling his name. But I've covered just enough distance to see that there's nobody there but there's something really off about the sight. I yell, hello, is anyone there? Sorry about the dog. I got no response. My curiosity gets the best of me and I have to see what the sight conditions are. As I get closer, I just know something is wrong. It had all the necessities for a campsite, including a cooler, propane burner, tent, blankets, folding table, everything but every single item had been completely destroyed, smashed, and torn apart from what appeared to be claw marks. We all walked around in circles, 
puzzled why anybody would leave all of their camping gear behind, including a fairly expensive REI tent. I figured, well, someone left in a hurry and the animals got to the rest. It had to be the only logical explanation, right? Still, a propane tank and a cooler were flattened by something, and it certainly wasn't snowpack with tree coverage in that spot. As the afternoon rolls in, my daughter and I are playing ball at the campsite, and my wife goes walking maybe 70 feet north to do her business. I don't have a direct line of sight on her, but all of a sudden I see Guts make a mad dash straight toward her. Normally he would always be with me, unless he's called over, and she didn't call for him. His speed and focus caught my attention, and I knew something weird was happening. So I ran over there, and my wife starts jogging at me, and I immediately draw my pistol. Guts has completely continued running into the forest another hundred feet before I call him, and he stops. My other dog, Leia, who never misses the opportunity to be the pack leader, is not taking point. I've had her for now seven years, and this was the first time in her life that she refused to leave my daughter's side. She was full hair raised and attached to us at the hip. Again, anytime we hike or play, Leah is up front, bossing everything in her path, pausing to see where we all are and then continuing on. I asked my wife what had happened, and she said, I was trying to pee and all of a sudden I felt all my hair raise. I knew someone was watching me. Then I saw Guts running toward me and I just got up to move toward you. We spent 10 minutes looking for signs of anything and saw no trails, no broken branches, nothing to point to what and where something might have gone. We decide that we're spending one more night since it's too late to pack up and drive, but we'll all be in the big tent together. Before we go to bed, I put a rope with a makeshift coin alarm around the perimeter of our campsite. I used a mint can, some coins, and keys from our truck, and zip-tied it so that anything hitting the rope gave a little jingle. Very unsophisticated, but it put my wife at ease. As I go to tie my last corner off at a tree near our tent, our third mystery item unveils itself. It looks like someone has done the exact same thing that I have done with a rope that was so old and brown I didn't see it at first. It was broken, and only a few pieces remained, but sure enough, it was tied at roughly the same height, about eight to 10 inches off the ground, and even had a few rusted washers on it. I immediately felt that someone had stayed here before and had put the same makeshift warning system on the same tree that I am, maybe 10 or 15 years ago based on the condition of the rope. Perhaps my paranoia has now reached a new height, but I had to make sure that the girls felt we were safe. And at the time, the only thing I could think of was when the evening came, I made them sit in the truck and I fired a clip of my 45 into the dirt as a signal to whatever was out there that we were armed. I reassured the girls that anybody listening to that knows that we have two wolves and are armed and are too risky of a target so we can sleep safely. That night we heard no footsteps and the dogs never perked up and barked. We left early the next morning. Fast forward to today and I watched the Amazon Missing 411 hunted documentary and I noticed the cluster smack dab close to where we camped that weekend, and a flood of dread rushes at me as I think of that mysterious abandoned campsite with the ripped tent and the smashed cooler and cooktop. We've been camping since and have enjoyed the beauty of the Pacific Northwest, but there was something there at that place that possibly took or harmed someone else less than 300 feet away from where we camped. We all thank our lucky stars that Guts was doing his thing so well that afternoon. As an update, Guts is no longer with us. He has journeyed into the next phase, and there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about him and how he likely saved us that night. He was a warrior, and his new brother, Geronimo, has his spirit.
I served in Marja, Helmand province during 2010 to 2011, where I had a series of strange experiences. Among them, I saw the mysterious lights in the sky that another person had reported, but one incident in particular struck absolute terror into me. One night, I was standing guard at my post alone, sometime between 0200 and 0400. The night was uncharacteristically quiet, which was strange given that there were usually dogs barking and goats randomly screaming. My post was situated at the northeast corner of our forward operating base, or FOB, isolated and a good 100 yards plus from the next post. Built on part of a mud wall enclosing the compound, the post was like an enclosed treehouse, elevated about 15 feet high. A sturdy roof allowed for an additional vantage point. Nearby was a mud hut where some Afghan security guards slept. I was immersed in thought, sipping on rippets and pondering my life choices, when suddenly I heard something running along the wall behind me. Since the wall was only a foot thick, it would be impossible for a person to run atop it. The sound was not like a dog's. It was more of a chick-chick noise, like the tapping of talons. As it reached the section of concertina wire near the top of the wall, the creature leaped onto the roof of my post, stomping its feet right above my head. It sounded like a full-grown man intentionally intimidating me. Then, just as swiftly, it sprinted full speed, leaping onto the roof of the mud hut where the Afghan guard slept and disappearing into the darkness. I didn't see it, but I heard it, and I felt its presence. Panic set in, and I found myself frantically scanning with the thermal sights of my 240B machine gun, but I couldn't locate the creature anywhere. I was certain it was neither human nor animal. Its movements were too different, too deliberate. It was as if a large man had been stomping, but the way it leaped off was so rapid and fluid, as though it knew precisely where to go. That experience marked the most frightened I have ever been in my life, and until now, I have never shared it with anyone. The memory of that night continues to haunt me, an unexplained encounter that, as far as I'm concerned, defies all logic and reason. My grandparents have both passed quite a few years ago, but one of the stories that they told me has stuck with me all these years. Grandma and Grandpa were driving through Pennsylvania to an old family farm. The farm belonged to his uncle and cousins who lived there. Grandpa was a city kid and had visited the farm every summer for years as he was growing up. It had been about 25 years since he'd been, but he loved that farm and he wanted to introduce Grandma to his cousins and show her around the farm. As they drove closer to the farm, Grandpa began to tell Grandma about the little town that was on the road on the way to the farm. Soon they reached the little town. Grandpa was amazed that it hadn't changed a bit. Toward the end of town, they saw that a hotel was on fire. The road was blocked by firemen using an old-fashioned fire wagon with a water tank pulled by horses. They thought it was strange, but they just chalked it up to being rural Pennsylvania. Eventually, the water wagon moved and they could drive by. They reached the farm and after greeting grandpa's uncle and cousins, they shared the news about the fire at the hotel. Grandpa suggested they all go down to see if they could help. The relatives looked shaken. That's when one of the cousins explained that there was no town. Not anymore. About 20 years before, the hotel had burned down and the fire spread to most of the small town's main street. After their businesses were lost, people left the town. In fact, the uncle and cousins were the last people living in the area. Grandma and Grandpa 
couldn't believe it. They had just seen the town, the fire, even smelled the smoke. They and some cousins got in the car and drove back to town, going back the way they'd just come. And the town was gone. Just some burnt out shells of a few buildings remained. This happened a couple of years ago, when I was around 13 to 14 years old. I would go to Nerf Wars with my friends during the weekends with a semi-auto rifle and one of those revolver-looking pistols as a sidearm. On one of those occasions, I brought my girlfriend to the Nerf War with me. For some context, my girlfriend's my neighbor. She lives in the same area I do, and we've known each other for some time, since around preschool, I think. As you do for a Nerf war, you pack up spare darts, spare mags, etc. So the Nerf war ended and we had a great time as usual, and we went our separate ways. As my girlfriend and I start walking back home, my paranoia kind of kicks in, and I have a feeling that someone is following us. I glanced back slightly, and there was a guy in full black. At first I thought it was just one of my friends awkwardly following us. But then I remembered that none of them were wearing full plain black that day. So I turn back to my girlfriend and tell her that I think we're being followed. She glances back slightly and sees the same guy. She starts panicking, so I tell her to calm down. It's probably just some guy going to the subway as well. So we get on the train, hoping that the man would stop following us. As I'm making sure my rifle isn't bothering anyone, I didn't have space to store my Nerf rifle, even when it was taken apart, so I just had it slung around my waist. I feel my girlfriend's grip on my hand tighten. Then she whispers, telling me that the man was on the train as well and was staring at us. At this point, I'd had enough of this guy's crap. I was tired, and the last thing I needed was some dude stalking my girlfriend and I. Luckily, our stop was two stations away. So when we got there, we bounced right out of that car. I looked back and the man was indeed behind us. We get up to the streets, hoping that there would be at least someone or some sort of camera that would be able to see my girlfriend and I. But the streets were basically empty, with only a couple of people going back home. My girlfriend was trembling beside me, scared as all hell. I told her my plan and with some hesitancy, she agreed to it. I stopped moving to take a drink of water my girlfriend shifting her hand toward my leg so it wouldn't be as obvious. It was dark at the time. I felt her hand being ripped away from my leg and I heard her terrified screams. I decided to grab the closest weapon I had on me, the stock of my Nerf rifle. The stocks attached to Nerf guns with two clips latching onto them so it wouldn't take long to pull it on or off. My stock was pretty big. It wasn't metal, but it was a solid piece of plastic that could do some damage to someone's face. I whacked the guy around the face, grabbed my girlfriend's hand, and got out of there. We waved down the closest taxi, got on, and sighed, happy that we weren't being followed by some guy. I don't talk about this incident much, but I just wanted to share it and get it off my chest. Because of that incident, I stopped playing Nerf for a while. My Nerf's been stored in my Nerf armory for a couple of years, untouched. Every time I think of it, this incident comes to mind. When I was a teenager, I went to Pennsylvania to visit a friend and his family over the summer. I was about 15 years old at the time. And still to this day, I cannot forget the bizarre experience I had. It was a regular night and I was sleeping in my friend's room when I awoke having to pee. My friend had bunk beds and I was on the top bunk. So I had to hop down to make my way out of the bedroom and down the hall to the bathroom. I went into the hallway from my friend's room and because it was very dark, I kept one hand on the hallway as I made my way to the guest room door. 
which is located on the same side of the hallway as my friend's room. I knew that if I followed the wall to the guest room door, I could go straight across the hallway to the bathroom door, which is exactly what I did. I get into the bathroom, I turn on the light, I go pee, and when I finish, I look at myself for a minute in the mirror before returning to bed. Everything is normal up until this point. This isn't the first time that I've gotten up in their house in the night to use the bathroom, and I have always followed this same routine of following the walls with my hand in the dark. As I leave the bathroom, I do exactly the same thing to get back to my friend's room. I go straight across the hall from the bathroom door to the guest room door, and with one hand on the wall the whole time, I make my way back to my friend's room. This is where things get glitchy. I get to my friend's room and I enter it. But as I enter it, I'm not in my friend's room. I'm somehow in the office next to it. I realize immediately that this makes no sense because I had my hand on the wall the whole time as I had done countless times before. But here I am in the office. The office is not very big. It's a small square room with a closet next to the hallway door to my right as I enter it. Right away, I can see that there is light coming from inside the closet. So I turn and slide open the door. Inside the closet, there are four old TVs stacked one on top of the other. All of them are playing static. I am completely confused by this and I have no idea how I even got into the office to begin with, let alone why there are just four TVs in the closet playing static. I shake my head in confusion and decide to just go back to bed. I make my way out of the office, back into my friend's room, and although I'm still completely baffled by what just happened, I basically just go back to sleep. When I woke up the next morning, I immediately thought about what had happened, and I went straight into the office and opened the closet. There's nothing in there except for one jacket hanging on a hanger, right above where the TVs had been. I don't recall telling my friend or his family about this experience, and everyone that I've told since always says, well, obviously it was just a dream, which my logic really wants to agree with, but I know that this was not a dream. I recall every single moment from jumping out of the top bunk, walking down to the bedroom door, trying not to make a noise, everything. I remember how black the hallway was, the feeling of the wall on my fingers, every single detail, and everything about it was exactly the way it is in real life, except for the glitch. I work in construction and I go to different job sites every week or two. This past job site was in middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania, like literally just cornfields and cow pastures. There's a town, if you can call it that, it's really just a grouping of maybe 10 houses on a quarter mile of road and a single isolated gas station that was another mile down the road. I was on this job site for eight days. Monday to Friday, and then Monday to Wednesday the next week. After work every day, I would stop in at the gas station and get gas and a snack. The inside wasn't incredibly old, probably renovated in the past decade or so, and the checkout was on the left when you walked in. It looked like a normal small town convenience store. The clerk was a younger man who always wore interestingly patterned button up shirts bananas, colorful lizards, things like that, and I would always compliment him on his choice that day. The gas station was this way for the first seven days that I was there. On the last day that I was on the job site, I stopped into the gas station. It looked the same from the outside, but the inside was completely different. The inside was now a bit more run down, and the checkout was now on the right-hand side. The laminate floor tiles were chipped and worn. The countertop was faded. There was now a food warmer advertising that they sold breakfast burritos and bean burritos on Wednesdays. 
The clerk was an older woman with a gray mullet type haircut. Not like it was a style choice, but just like she hadn't changed her hair since 1980. I don't think I went back in time or anything crazy like that because on the counter by the register, there were signs up for the annual 2019 meat shoot. For non-country folk, target shooting competitions where the prize is meat. In any case, I didn't feel out of place or have any weird vibes about it. I was just very confused as to where my cashier friend went and why the store was suddenly pretty shabby. And other than that sign, kind of stuck in the 80s. It was really, really weird. This is a true story of events that have taken place in my home. My brother-in-law tragically took his life in the barn of our family farm. Without going into detail, his death has caused a lot of friction, anger, and sadness for the family he left behind, with a big point of contention being his widow. She decided to have him cremated, but never laid his ashes to rest or had any memorial for him. Needless to say, my husband, the decedent's brother, has had many sleepless nights over this loss, including disturbing waking dreams. This tragedy took place in early March of 2020, and by late March, I began hearing and seeing some strange things. One early evening, while watching TV in our first floor family room, while my husband was upstairs and my mother-in-law was next door in her in-law apartment, I heard something that sounded like three faint knocks on the glass door that leads to our mudroom. I got up to see who was there, because it's common for other family members, such as my sister-in-law and her kids who live farther down on our farm, to come by unannounced. There was no one there. I thought it was strange, and I went upstairs to tell my husband that somebody stopped by, but they must have left before I answered the door. I thought about it a few times while I sat back down to watch TV, but I just dismissed the knocks. A few weeks later, my husband woke me up in the middle of the night, not knowingly, but by talking in his sleep and knocking on our headboard three times really loudly. As time has passed and I'm trying to recall what he said, the exact words escaped me, but he said something about his brother. It was almost as though he was talking to him. I lightly shook my husband to wake him up and to tell him what he had just done. He didn't believe me or remember doing or saying anything. As I tried to go back to sleep, the three knocks stood out to me because I had heard three knocks that one evening. Only a few nights later, I was feeling a little sick and I decided to sleep in our guest bedroom downstairs so I wouldn't get my husband sick. With the virus going on and everything, I didn't want to take a chance. I usually fall asleep early, so I was asleep by 9.30 or 10 p.m. Around 11.30, something woke me up, and when I opened my eyes, I noticed something shining on the wall a reflection from somewhere. I kept trying to focus my eyes because sometimes the light from outside comes into that guest bedroom and I wanted to understand what was making the reflection. I got up and opened the bedroom door a bit more. It was ajar already and I saw a flickering coming from the dining room. I was startled and I got a bit scared at first, but I decided to go into the dining room to check it out. Two slim white candlesticks sit on our mantel on either side of the Picasso that hangs above the fireplace. One of those candles was on and flickering. This had never happened before, and I started to think that maybe this was a sign from my brother-in-law. My husband was still awake, so I went upstairs and told him what I had seen. He was interested to hear the story, thought about it for a second, but then just dismissed it. I did not go back to sleep downstairs that night. 
I slept in our own bed, sickness and all, because I was a little frightened. I told my mother-in-law the next day what had happened, and out of the blue, she recalled that a few days ago, she got a knock on her door around 3 a.m. She got up and opened the door because, as I said, it's not uncommon for one of the family members on our farm to do something like that. Although, 3 a.m. would have been uncommon, but still, no one was there. She didn't even think to tell anybody about it, but when I mentioned the knocking before, it gave her a bit of a chill. We talked for a bit about what the significance of three knocks could be. I said, three brothers, my husband, his middle brother, and the oldest, who was the one that was deceased. My brother-in-law also had three children. Days and weeks passed and nothing happened. Until one evening, down that hallway to the guest bedroom, the overhead light turned on by itself. I saw it turn on from my seat in the family room. This time, I didn't bother to tell my husband right away because he hadn't seemed to care much about these strange things that were happening. I got up and I turned the light off. Because I was thinking that it was my brother-in-law, I was no longer scared, but frustrated a bit because I didn't know why he would be doing these things for me to see when I wasn't even really related to him or all that close to him even though he lived right next door. The next night, I was getting ready for bed in the bathroom down that hallway and I noticed out of the corner of my eye a flickering. It was about 11.30 p.m. That same candle was flickering again. I went upstairs and woke up my husband to tell him. I took a video of it when I saw it this time and I showed him the video. He came downstairs to see for himself. He thought it was strange, but he didn't want to talk about it, and he went back to bed. Nothing happened again for a while, probably a month or two. Then, one afternoon when my husband and I were watching TV together in the family room, he said, Hun, the hallway light just turned on by itself. I said, see, I told you this stuff was happening. After that day, my husband began to think that his brother could be trying to contact us. He called his other brother and told him all of the strange things that had been happening. That brother dismissed everything and tried to talk my husband out of believing that it was their brother. My husband still believed it despite what his middle brother had said. I saw the hallway light turn on again by itself a few evenings later. I saw the candle flickering a few more times, one night around 8.30 p.m. and the other times around 11 or midnight. Over the past year, my husband woke up three times having these strange waking dreams of talking to his brother loudly in his sleep. Once, my husband sounded like he was having a full conversation with his deceased brother about his nephew passing his driving test. I recall that he said, he's going to fail? And you know what? The next day, our nephew did surprisingly fail his driver's test. The last occasion I heard a knocking on was January of last year. It sounded like it was coming from the laundry room, which is near that glass door where it all started. But this time, it was only one knock. In February of last year, I started to think that having the ashes and doing something to honor my husband's brother was a must to stop my husband from crying most days and everyone feeling overall terrible about the situation. My husband, his mom, and his brother all needed closure, as did I. I spoke with the family member who had control over the ashes and she was not agreeable to giving some to me to make a necklace with. You can make these necklaces with a tiny vessel for ashes. I wanted to do it for my husband's birthday. I was devastated. But, to our surprise and comfort, two days before my husband's birthday, he was presented with a beautiful engraved vessel on a chain containing a tiny amount of the ashes to wear as a necklace. It wasn't a gravestone or funeral service, but we were all really relieved and happy to honor him and put some of the hard feelings to rest. I still wondered why I was the one who saw or heard most of these things but I do feel sometimes that I'm a bit of an empath. 
I react so strongly to my feelings of sympathy and empathy for living things to the point where I cry, get physically ill, or can't sleep, thinking about these things that bother me that I can't control, like people in pain or animals dying. I also thought about why most of these things were happening downstairs in that hallway and dining room. And then I remembered, the dining room used to be their parents' bedroom and there used to be a different way to enter the staircase to the boys' bedroom upstairs, which was in that hallway area years ago. I think my brother-in-law's spirit was in our house, and in his peaceful spirit naivete, found his energy in places that seemed familiar as a child. His parents' room, the door where he'd come in for milking the cows, or trying to make his way upstairs. I never thought there was any evil or scary intent. I believe my brother-in-law knew some things were left undone, unsaid, and that his family was suffering from the unfair loss of him, and was trying to put our minds at ease. Once we got the bit of his ashes, everything felt much more at peace, and our minds are now at ease. I don't think we'll see or hear anything else, except maybe a little reminder of him from time to time. The hallway light still flickers every now and then. I always wanted to share this story, but I've never done it before, so here goes. This is a story from long ago before crawlers were a thing that people talked about that much, before the internet exploded, and that annoying modem sound came on if you were lucky enough to have a computer and an internet connection. It was around 1999, and I was living in very rural upstate New York. If you don't know, or you've never been to the area of the Catskill Mountains, it's small town after small town, surrounded by forest and farmlands, not much to do back then, but hang out with your friends and drive around. At least, that's what I did with my friends, besides the weekly house party. My best friend and I were very into the paranormal back then, and we both experienced many unexplained things our entire lives. Being in our late teens, young adulthood, we just decided we were curious, and at the time, we also both identified as Wiccan. We spent a lot of time in those woods, we would meditate, do earthy spells, have lunch, and camp out. So, needless to say, we were not afraid of the woods, the dark, or being completely isolated in the middle of nowhere. One night, on one of our late winter drives to nowhere, we ended up on a road that we hadn't really been on before. We pulled off on the side to where this old schoolhouse was. We parked the car, got out and looked in the windows to check it out and see what was inside. It appeared to be kept up as a historical site. There were old desks inside and old chalkboards, things like that. It was really neat, but we did have that creepy feeling that you get at places where the veil is thin. So, of course, we returned there several times after. We were just drawn to the place. A few times, we went during the day with some other girlfriends to check it out. As we took a walk in the woods behind the schoolhouse, we all felt this odd feeling. The only way we could really describe it was like what I've heard of as walking through a fairy circle. The ambient lighting around us felt different. I can't really describe it other than almost more of a vivid color experience around us as the sun came through the trees. We didn't think we were there all that long, maybe an hour, but when we returned to the car, it had been several hours and it was early evening, maybe around five or 6 p.m. and we'd gotten there at noon. One of my best friends and I went at night again. We were sitting in the car, just talking, drinking our gas station bought cappuccino purchased for our night drive, and we kept hearing this tap 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 sound out loud i said knock it off to the nothing that was there 
Right as I say this, we hear what we could only describe as children's feet running away from behind to the side of the car. That little pitter-patter that only kids can make. It freaked us both out, and we got the heck out of there. There was no way that anyone was there. Like I said, this was a rural main road to a dirt road pull-off. Completely pitch black. No street lights. No cars going by in the distance or anything. If someone did show up, they would have been walking in the dark for miles to get there. And it certainly wouldn't be a child. It's kind of sad when I think about it now. I certainly hope it wasn't a roaming spirit of a child, gone too soon from this place. Anyway, that's where the freakiest part happens. And we never did return to that old school after this. As we're getting back onto the main road, there in the headlights, we saw something scurry across the road quickly. It looked like a hairless, naked human, crawling low to the ground, its elbows bent so high that its belly was close to the road, like a grasshopper, and its knees looked like they were bent backwards. I remember us both turning to look at each other with that panicked look on our faces. We then said, What the heck was that? Did you just see that? What the heck was that? We drove home kind of trembling and not saying a whole lot. I remember I kept looking in the rear view mirror, half expecting to see this thing chasing us down the road. Luckily, we did not. My friends and I are still best friends to this day, and we sometimes talk about this series of events. Years later, we saw the movie The Descent, and it immediately made us both think of that old schoolhouse and the thing that we saw run across the road that night. It was a freaky place, experience, and time. Also exciting and slightly terrifying. I now live across the country, far away from New York, but I often wonder about that old schoolhouse and those woods. Someday, I think I would like to return, now that I'm older and in a different place in my life. I would like to see if it's still there, and just see how I feel about all of it now. But I would never ever want to see that thing that we saw so many years ago. Last January, I was between jobs, and I had just recently had a daughter, who was at the time about five months old. My husband had been working through my pregnancy, but lost his job. We were living at my mom's house. I have an education in psychology and some experience as a counselor, so I was looking for the best I could get. But the best I could find right away was a job working as a paraprofessional in the special education department of an elementary school in a nearby suburb. The position was unique to the virus times, being that they needed someone to just sit around in the computer room while the kiddos did speech therapy over Zoom. Don't get me started on how terrible virtual speech therapy is. But anyway, my job was to just walk around the school back and forth between classrooms and the computer room, picking up kids, taking them to the Zoom room, sitting there for 30 minutes to an hour depending on the kid, taking them back, Picking up the next batch, I was overqualified, we'll say. Some days of the week were scheduled tightly, and other days of the week I routinely had just two appointments. The school was a ginormous horseshoe shape, housing 700 elementary school children. I was located all the way at the far back on one side of the pre-K wing, it could take 15 minutes to walk all the way across the building and back when the kids I was picking up were in the older grades. Every day I would make this walk. In the middle of the school, across from the front office, I would always notice, and try to ignore, this strange rag doll with construction paper over its face, showcased in a display case. No bad vibes from it, but it just seemed out of place and random. It was there the entire five months that I worked there, never changing or having anything added to the case. 
onward. Well, weird things happened in the computer room where I worked. The doors in the school use a key to lock from both the inside and outside. The doors do not lock automatically. You absolutely 100% have to manually lock them with a key. We are technically supposed to lock rooms when we leave them empty throughout the day, but no one ever did. So I just left my door unlocked when I went to get the kids. I would go get a kid in pre-K, so they'd literally be like two classrooms away, less than a minute to pick them up and walk back. My door would be locked by the time I returned. Sometimes I would be gone longer, but sometimes that's all it would take, just 60 seconds. I messed around with the door in my free time, trying to figure out how it was locking. The only conclusion I could come up with was that somebody was manually locking it when I was gone. I asked the janitor, because he was always around, and he said no, he'd never done it. I asked if it could lock itself, and he said no, it's not possible. So I came to the conclusion that somebody was messing with me trying to teach me a lesson for not locking my door or something passive aggressively. Well, I don't play that. So I texted my boss, the vice principal, and I asked her to come talk to me when she had some time. I explained the situation to her and she said that she was sure that nobody would ever do something like that. She also said she would have maintenance look at the door. That was the end of it. I come back after the weekend and the door is broken, like off kilter on the hinges so it won't even shut all the way. I guess locking on its own won't be a problem anymore. The school did have security cameras in the halls. I wonder if they had any video of me pushing the doorknob down to check that it was unlocked before walking off, returning and having it being locked. Anyway, after that, there was a day where I went to get a kid out of his classroom in the pre-K wing by my office, but they switched up the schedule that day so the class wasn't in there. I shrugged it off, went to go pick up the other kid that also sat in there for this block, and then came back. There was another paraprofessional watching her own kids in the playroom nearby, so I asked her if she knew where the other class would be right now. She said she didn't know, but that she thought she had just seen a kid run in there. Maybe they were going in to use the bathroom. I said, okay, and I went back into the empty classroom. I have the other little kid with me at this point. There's a bathroom at the back of the class, but it's open. I walk over there, confused, and check the room. I even look behind the door, and there is no kid. I shrug my shoulders at the other little one and begin walking back toward the exit of the room. The bathroom door slams shut behind me. The other little kid jumped out of his skin. I tried to remain calm. The other paraprofessional nearby sees us out in the hallway, peering into the empty classroom, presumably looking very puzzled and a little freaked out. She asks if the kid was in there. I said, no, but the door slammed behind me when I was walking out. I trailed off, looking down at the kiddo with me, who was looking back up at me with his eyes as wide as ever. Probably just the wind, I say. The other para kind of looks at me crazy but shrugs it off and keeps about her business. The kid I was with, I kid you not, whispers, it was a ghost. And of course I say, no, no, I'm sure it was just because I messed with the door. You know, the obvious. Incident blows off, a couple of weeks pass by, and I'm in the empty computer room working on art for the walls. It's Wednesday, so it's an early day for pre-K, and all of the littles have gone home, while the real teachers are in a staff meeting. Someone knocks at my office door. Mind you, the door no longer shuts all the way, so I figure they don't want to barge in. I get up from my desk five feet away, and I open the door. Nobody is there. I look down the hallway, and nobody is there. I go sit back down more annoyed than anything, and it happens again. At this point, I'm kind of fed up. I do practice witchcraft and I've been doing so seriously for more than 16 years, but I have no mediumship abilities or anything like that. I don't deal with ghosts and spirits in my practice. 
but that's the reason that I'm not scared at this point. I ask the janitor if the place is haunted. Man, this guy doesn't skip a beat. And he says, oh yeah, Rodney? Rodney, yeah, that little boy. He died in there. They named that doll across from the office after him, you know? What the heck? I asked my supervisor to confirm this and she said, Oh yeah, no one ever told you about Rodney, huh? I'm like, yeah, well that could have been in your ad. So at this point, I've become acquaintances with the school librarian. I ask her about what's going on. She says all kinds of people have had weird experiences. Night janitors have had things move on their own. One time, the top principal had an alarm go off, showing somebody was down in the basement at 3 a.m. But none of the outside doors had gone off and nobody was on video in the school at the time. I guess another time over spring break, the doll across from the office got ripped up in his display case, his head laying on the ground. Which is why he has a construction paper on him now. No one on camera and nothing on the camera of the doll. Another staff member never believed in ghosts until she saw a little boy run into a classroom and then promptly disappear. That's about the extent of things that happened to me there, but I became fascinated. Some staff knew of the ghost, some had never heard anything about it. Mostly, staff who worked on my side of the building had experiences. The other side of the building seemed like a whole other world, totally normal, no ghosts over there. I became the weird ghost girl, I'm sure, always asking people if they'd seen anything. I am not the person to pretend like nothing's going on, so as not to stir the pot. No way. Of course, I'd never let the kiddos hear me. No one other than the janitor ever seemed to have heard of anybody dying at the school. But people who had heard of the ghost, or had experiences, did have their theories. One day, I asked a paraprofessional from another school in the district, because at a meeting, she mentioned that she herself had attended that elementary school where I worked. She didn't know anything about a ghost, but she did say that while she attended, a boy died at the school, in the wing, where I work. He had the flu and his heart gave out. It's actually a really very sad story that I'll just spare you, but she could corroborate. She said that they hung a drawing of him up in the hallway to commemorate him. Sure enough, among the plaques, there's this framed picture of a swimming hole and a mountain in memory of Ernie, not Rodney. I found a much better job and quit during summer vacation, but I did tell Ernie or Rodney or whoever in the silence of the computer room in the last week of school that if he wanted to, he could cross over that he didn't have to be stuck at the school. I even had a sacred place out in the country where I believe the veil is thin and that he was welcome to come there with me. Like I said, no psychic abilities here, but I did drive out there on the last day and I put down a birdhouse for Ernie. I really hope that he's doing well. In 2012, I found myself stationed in North Kandahar, standing guard one night just shy of midnight. My attention was drawn to some unexpected movement in a nearby rubbish heap. Initially, it seemed to be just a dog rummaging around, but to my astonishment, it rose on its hind legs and walked away nonchalantly in a disturbingly human manner. Fear gripped me. Upon inquiring from the local villagers, we were told that it was a yeti, part of a family that had resided in a nearby cave. They ominously shared how these creatures occasionally kidnapped and ate villagers. The chill that ran down my spine at this translation was palpable, and it was clear I wasn't the only one affected. This spectacle was witnessed by everyone in our combat outpost, or COP and it earned the humorous moniker, Man-Bear-Pig. 
Although we all laughed it off, when the opportunity arose to track the creature, no volunteers stepped forward. One midnight, as I was about to drift off to sleep on my cot, the crackle of gunfire from the Afghan army side of the camp startled me awake. Accompanied by the master sergeant, we quickly armed ourselves and went to investigate the commotion. The Afghani soldiers explained they had spotted the Yeti and opened fire, but it had managed to escape. The master sergeant turned to me and proposed, with a jovial glint in his eye, you want to rally the troops and hunt this creature down? We could become famous. I simply shook my head in silent refusal. We shared a chuckle and retreated back to our cots, leaving the Yeti to its nightly escapades. Several years back, when my niece was a four-year-old toddler, now she's eight, she uttered something quite peculiar. My sister and her husband had just brought home an irresistibly charming puppy. The pup was a bit high-spirited, but absolutely delightful. As we were all engaging with the little canine one day, I was sharing the couch with my sister, who was expecting her third child, a fact I had dreamt about in a prophetic vision. A story for another time. Suddenly, my niece revealed to us that she had owned a dog in the past. This caught my sister and me off guard. Curious, I asked her, Really? Was your dog similar to Bobby? She answered, No, my previous dog was larger and much more well-behaved. Then came the strangest part. My grandson got the dog for me as a companion after my husband passed away. Puzzled, my sister inquired further into what she meant. My husband passed away and my grandson gifted me a dog, she repeated, her focus unwavering from the dog's belly she was gently rubbing. She relayed this as if it were an undeniable fact, with no names given. The same evening, she mentioned there was a ghost named George, upstairs, waiting for her to accompany him. However, she declared that she wasn't ready to ascend the staircase with him just yet. The entire episode was deeply uncanny. So I live in a city named Oshkosh in Wisconsin, and if you've never been to Oshkosh, there are a lot of older things that are still in use. This is especially true of the schools there, and by this I mean the middle and high schools. Now my mom is a teacher in the Oshkosh area school district and currently teaches at a school named Merrill, which is both an elementary and a middle school and is one of the oldest schools in the city. She has to go there on weekends in addition to the school week every once in a while to take care of extra grading, classroom management, and things like that. A few weeks ago, my sister and I joined her on one of her extra days on the weekend there. And my sister and I have already had some weird stuff happen to us there, such as hearing footsteps out in the hall when we know we're the only ones in the building. My sister had a balloon in the classroom once come down from the ceiling and basically chase her. So she and I are already aware of the paranormal tendencies of this place. Anyway, the three of us walk in with me being a six foot one, 160 pound male first, because apparently that makes me the expendable one. And we start walking up to her room, which is on the third floor. Now, it's necessary to mention that her school has limited access to each of its separate areas, so middle school teachers can't easily get into the elementary school and vice versa. It's necessary to mention that because as I walked up to her room, I was struck silent and motionless by a figure that I saw standing in front of me, walking away from me. 
The figure then turns down the next hall to the left. I turn back to my mom to show her where the figure had turned. She said, well, that doesn't make any sense. That's a dead end hallway. Anybody who went down that way would have quickly noticed this and turned around. Yet nobody did. We stood there for a short while to see if anybody came back. Nobody ever did. When I say figure, I don't mean some trick of the light. As a lover of the paranormal, I am also at the same time one of the most cold-hearted skeptics you can imagine. Because when I experience something, I want to exercise the possibility of it being anything else before coming to the conclusion that it's paranormal. I have thought of everything, be it a trick of the light, a shadow, something passing over a nearby window, but nothing makes sense to me based on what I saw. The only light emitted in the area was by the overhead lights, which clearly showed a very tall, well-built figure of indeterminate gender or skin color walking away from me. There were no windows nearby to cause an illusion like a passing vehicle. The possibility that it was someone who needed something down a hallway or a janitor needing to clean the hallway had also crossed my mind. So I made my mom question everybody with access to that area during the weekend to see if anybody had been near that section of building, but nobody had. My sister also confirmed that she had seen that figure too, so it couldn't just have been my mind playing tricks on me. This experience sticks out in my mind, but the part that still brings tears to my eyes and raises goosebumps on my skin is the sound that we heard with it. It was like a wail, like a cry, this scream almost. The thing about it is that it was a very windy day and there was wind whistling through the halls of this old building. But then the wind stopped and the screaming continued. It wasn't only the wind. My mom has been in that building a lot of times with wind and without and she said she had never heard a sound like that before. I still have no reasonable explanation for this. I remember my first day of my new school. This was only a couple of years ago. I remember exploring the school for the first time. I clearly remember walking up a large flight of stairs to a second floor. I remember there being two water fountains to the left and the stairs being next to the bathrooms. I never went there again since it was on the opposite end and it wasn't there the next year when I checked it out. My friend clearly remembers the exact same thing. They weren't fake memories because we both remember the exact same thing. However, nobody other than him and me and maybe a couple of other people remember it. We decided to check it out one day and look for any sign of a second floor in and around the bathrooms, but there was nothing. Where there were stairs, there was just a blank wall. We even asked around and a couple of very confused people told us that the school had never had a second floor. I am so confused. Skinwalker Screams A few years ago, I was taking part in a church camp. We were sleeping in tents on a wide area that was surrounded by a deep forest. The next village was far away, and it was dark as heck at night without any city light shining in the distance. It always had a kind of eerie feeling, but I didn't think much of it, until this happened. The restrooms of our camp were pretty far from our tents, on the exact opposite of the campsite. So if I needed to go to the bathroom at night, I would have to grab a flashlight 
get out of my tent and walk across the whole area of grass and dirt. One night I needed to pee, so I shook a friend of mine awake and asked if she could go with me to the bathroom. I was really afraid as we both got out of the tent and started walking. It was deadly silent. The only thing we could hear was the sound of the river nearby. We got to the bathroom and as we left a couple of minutes later, I couldn't get to our tent fast enough. As we were halfway across the land, my heart froze. I could have sworn that it had gotten even more silent out than it was before. That's when we heard it. An absolutely horrible scream, inhuman, filled with dread and sorrow. It didn't sound like some kind of animal. It was so loud that we both jumped a little. It came right out of the dark forest, far away, but so loud that it felt like it was right beside me. It even echoed a couple of times until it vanished. Then the insects began to make noises again. My friend and I were terrified and ran for our lives. I hadn't slept that night, not even a little. I covered my ears like crazy, too afraid of what I might hear if I listened. I don't know if anybody else has experienced something like that. The only thing I've ever come across online is skinwalker screams and they sounded just like that. I've had paranormal experiences before, but since I'm familiar with working with spirits and stuff, those I know how to handle, but this scream sends shivers down my spine to this day, and I still don't have any explanation for it. I never thought that Wendigos were a thing in Germany, but maybe they are? I really don't know. So a little backstory. I went to a special needs school for nine years, one of the Tivin schools in Denmark. The buildings are over 130 years old and they have a lot of history, including being a tuberculosis treatment center. The basement was where all the creative things were, like paint and stone cutter tools, the library and some other things. At the time I was 13 to 14 I'm female, I was also very creative, and I loved to go down there after school because I could just hide in there and be myself and make things. To get there, you'd have to walk through a very loud door, go left just a little bit, and then go through another door, a glass door, and then finally the last door. You could always, always hear it when somebody was coming down there because it was just so loud. The person who was supposed to be taking care of me left, and I was alone in the basement in that room. I heard the door and everything and them walking up the stairs. Then I heard a whisper. I couldn't hear what they were saying, but it was definitely a woman. The person who was taking care of me was a man, so it wasn't him. I looked to where I had heard the whisper, and this is where I saw a transparent woman in old-fashioned clothing. From what I could tell, it seemed like something was running down her face. When I think about it now, maybe it was blood, but it was pretty dark. We made eye contact. Surprisingly, I wasn't scared. I didn't really think about it. It was normal to see things down there, to hear things. I asked if she was okay, and she screamed in a way that I can't describe. Honestly, it was like a banshee. And then she just disappeared. The weird thing is, my stepdad's father passed away a little over a week later. To this day, I can't be totally sure what I saw down there. I know banshees aren't from Denmark, but that scream, it was odd and different. It wasn't like a normal scream. And them being harbingers of doom and all that, and then something bad happening later. I don't know. 
I'm 21 now and I'm still as confused as I was back then. All I know is that that school was definitely haunted because I'm not the only one who saw some things there. So back in June of 2021, I had moved, and while I was driving, we went through Wisconsin. I can't really remember the town or anything, so I'm sorry about that, but it was around 2 to 3 in the morning. We had stopped to try to get gas, but when we got into one town, it was like a ghost town. There were no cars or anything, and while yes, it was pretty early, Keep in mind that we had seen cars all the way up until this point, at least sporadically. Regardless, we noticed a gas station that was all lit up. All the lights were on inside, and an open light was glowing and everything. Yet when we got closer and tried to go in the doors, they were locked. We even went around the back, looking for a car, but nothing. Not to mention, Every single gas pump set out of order. We got back in the car, not really thinking anything of it. Until we found another gas station, maybe a block away. And I'm not even kidding when I say the exact same thing happened. By now I was a bit put off, but I wasn't about to convince myself that we had entered some weird wormhole. Until it happened a third time. At this point, I didn't even want to get out of the car, but I needed to stretch my legs. When I did though, my friend who was driving went to try the doors. Nothing. When he was on his way back to the car, there was a blood-curdling scream. It genuinely made me sick to my stomach. My reaction was visceral. And keep in mind, it was so quiet up until this point but we made our way out of there as fast as we could, and we didn't see any cars again until we got back on a main highway. After that, and after getting settled into my apartment, my roommates and I just didn't feel well. When I was unpacking with one of them, something fell twice, and we still don't know how it did. A few days later, my other roommate said that she felt like there was something in the apartment, I felt it too, but I'm kind of a paranoid person by default, so I had always assumed it was just me. She is not though, so this validated to me that some kind of presence was there. I don't know what to call this. It was just a really weird experience, and a story that I wanted to share. My fiance and I had just left Ripley's Believe It or Not in Wisconsin Dells, and he was getting hungry. Being that I only survive on antiques and Advil, I wasn't in such a hurry to find him any sustenance. I popped open Chad Lewis's book entitled Paranormal Wisconsin Dells and Baraboo that I had just picked up from Ripley's, and I began to thumb through it in the parking lot eager to find the next stop on our New Year's Day adventure. I settled on the old Baraboo Inn. I'll let you do your own research about it, but I wanted to share my own personal encounter there. Because unless Mr. B.C. Farr is a master electrician with a trick kill switch behind the bar, and there isn't, I absolutely believe that we had a bona fide paranormal experience at Wisconsin's most haunted tavern. According to Google, OBI has a fantastic menu. Depending upon which reviews you read, the food is good too. We set off to Baraboo and found the beautiful stately building easily enough, located at 135 Walnut Street. We went inside and all was quiet. I immediately started looking around, taking in the scene and, after a beat or two, 
we were greeted by an enormous black lab from the back room and a man's voice excitedly welcoming us in. Before I was able to pinpoint where the voice was coming from, a smartly dressed jovial man in probably his 50s popped out from a door behind the bar and asked how we were doing and what brought us in today. I told him we were looking for a drink and a menu and he informed me that they no longer keep a kitchen but he would be more than happy to make us a drink. He said, do you know where you are right now? I laughed and told him that yes, we picked this place out of a book to sightsee and he proceeded to tell us that we were in the most haunted tavern in Wisconsin. As this conversation transpired, he had begun making our bourbon sours and the jukebox had queued up Hey Tonight by CCR. I was watching him generously pour our drinks and I could see both of his hands for the duration of our exchange. Just as he took his thumb off of the soda gun, the jukebox quit. Just stopped, dead silent in the middle of a song. We all looked over to the old row that was still all lit up, but the number display was flashing zeros. The bartender, who apparently was the owner as well, turned his full body toward it and exclaimed, Now what did you do that for? That was a good tune. He turned to me and said, You just gotta talk to them. Welcome to my world. He went back to finishing my fiancé's drink, handed it over to him and held mine for an extra second. He was eyeballing me, probably because I was still looking at the jukebox display. I'd never seen an older one like that just error out before, and I found it unusual. He said, that's never happened before. Are you a sensitive? Pardon? I jolted out of the sinking feeling I was having at not fully understanding what had just happened, and I hadn't realized he was talking to me. Are you a sensitive? He asked again. Do you believe in ghosts? I hesitated, not wanting to make a mark of myself, and I responded, Oh, um, kind of. Well, don't matter. They believe in you, he said. I haven't heard not a peep out of them all day until just now. They're responding to you. Either you're a sensitive or you brought something in here with you. You got some kind of energy. With that, he handed me my drink, waved away my money, and whisked us all to the gangster back bar, as he called it, to watch the episode of Hometown Haunting that just happened to have a feature on Baraboo and the old Baraboo Inn. It was a really neat experience, and that place is certainly invaluable for its historical significance alone. But if you ask me, my final summation is that they don't serve food, but they certainly got some kind of energy. BC Far knows how to make a good stiff one. I live in the mountains and my hollow is surrounded by woods. There's a little spot you can walk into in the woods which is just a giant circle with trees open all around it. My friend and I have gone to picnic there. And this day that we went there, we started hearing this flute. It was really loud and it was coming from a direction where there were no houses. It sounded like a woodwind of sort, something that sounded very spiritual. All of my neighbors were pretty old and I can guarantee that none of them spend their time walking in the woods playing a flute. We heard this for hours. We left at about eight o'clock that night, and when we walked back, you could hear it somewhat across the valley. I didn't hear it again for about two years after that, but one night I woke up at three o'clock in the morning. My bed was right next to the window and I had cracked it to let in some fresh air while I slept. I woke up to the sound of the flute coming right outside my window. I was too worried to look out and see what it was. It went on for about an hour before it finally stopped playing 
and to this day, I have never heard it again. At the time of this event, I was living in downtown Toronto, and I had just moved in with my new roommates. One guy was my buddy. The place I moved into used to be a shoe factory years ago. So the new place was great. I was chilling with my buddy and our other roommates. Joe and I made a joke about how this place must be haunted because of how old it is. Joe kind of brushed off what I was saying though and joked that if he told me stories, I would move out. Joe's been living there for like 20 years, so I don't doubt that he's seen some things. Before I get into the stories, I wanted to clarify that I'm not sure if I believe in ghosts. My attitude has always been that I can't really prove or disprove their existence, or of anything paranormal really. I've experienced quite a few strange encounters in my lifetime, but nothing to really sway my opinion that ghosts exist 100%. So it was a weekend night. I stayed up really late. It was like three or four in the morning, and I went out to the living area to get some water. As I was filling my water bottle, the whole time I was out there, I felt like something was drawing my attention toward the TV or couch area. The TV was always on. I don't know why. I feel like my roommates were just too lazy to turn it off. So I'm stumbling toward the couches and I could make out the shape of somebody's head from behind it. It was kind of this white transparent color. All I can remember is that as I got closer, there was this static from the TV that kept getting louder until the TV finally made a big pop noise. I ran back to my room. I just stood there in complete shock. I didn't move for like five minutes, just trying to comprehend what had happened. As I said before, I don't really believe in ghosts, but this scared me really badly. I've never felt an energy or something like that before. It's really hard to explain how I felt during that experience, but it gives me goosebumps just remembering it. The second story took place in the daytime. I was alone in the apartment cooking some brunch. In the apartment, there was a section of walls that were covered in mirrors. Joe made kind of a makeshift gym in front of them. So I was doing my normal thing, just cooking. But the whole time I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me with a sharp glare. Like I said, the TV is always on. So when you're cooking in the kitchen, you can see in the mirrors the TV area reflected. As I'm cooking, this like glitter or flash of light would pierce the corner of my eye, like somebody was trying to get my attention. This happened about three times. I'm starting to get more freaked out because the whole vibe of the apartment just felt really negative, which was odd. As I'm finishing up, the door to my room just shuts. It had been like halfway open. When that happened, I just left the apartment to get some fresh air. I didn't even touch the food I had just got done cooking. What really doesn't make sense about this is that the doors we had in that place were really heavy. They had soundproofing on them. So when you went to close them, you really had to pull on them. Those were the two really big things I had happen while I was living there. When I was living there, I had a girlfriend that would stay over all the time. I never mentioned anything about ghosts to her. We never talked about ghosts either when I was living there. It wasn't until I had moved out and we were on a date that I brought it up to her. All I asked her is if she ever saw or felt anything strange while I was living there. What she told me was pretty shocking. She told me about how she would have nightmares every once in a while where something would climb up to where we would sleep and attack her. The apartment had like eight meter ceilings, so the sleeping area was at the top. This freaked me out. 
because one time I had had a dream that somebody climbed up there and grabbed my feet. I actually woke up from that dream screaming. She also explained that she felt like there were multiple spirits there, some good, some bad. She's way more spiritual than I am. So I had a hard time wrapping my head around what she had said. She said she felt that there was a mix, like I said, good ones and also dark ones. Anyway, that was my experience living in this apartment that used to be a shoe factory. There were other instances of things happening, weird noises, doors closing, the normal. But these two events really stood out. A year ago, while living in New Jersey, I currently live in Michigan, I came across a strange news story about a young hiker discovered dead in a mountainous forest. It initially seemed a routine incident, but the circumstances soon proved to be strange. The report indicated that the mountain was undergoing a period of heavy rainfall during that time. The downpour was relentless, sometimes exceeding half an inch per hour and it continued for several days before and during the search for the man. An autopsy conducted by a medical examiner revealed intriguing findings. Aside from a few scratches on his knees, the man displayed no visible injuries or signs of infection. However, the condition of his lungs and airways was alarming. The autopsy report emphasized the remarkable presence of pus in his tracheal bronchial tree. The man was only 28 years old. What's even stranger is that the coroner suggested the rainfall might have contributed to his condition. By the time the hiker was found, he had been dead for three days, and there was no record of him issuing any distress calls. It also hinted that hypothermia was not the cause of death. After this report, there were no subsequent updates about the man's case. It was a startling silence for such an unusual incident. A man found lifeless on a mountain, his lungs and airways filled with an abnormal amount of fluid. Sometimes, I still wonder about what really happened to him. I feel creeped out even typing this story. I'm staying at my friend's house in Tennessee over winter break, and tonight I helped her feed the neighbor's dogs because they were out of town. Her house is in a somewhat rural area. There are clusters of homes kind of spread across fields, forests, and lake areas, all very beautiful and full of lots of wildlife. It's about 9 p.m. and it's way past sunset. It's quite dark and we're walking the short distance from the neighbor's house back to hers. We are on a road, but directly next to us is a small wooded area sloping down to the lake. I'm a little nervous about it, so I make a joke like, that forest is kind of creeping me out. Imagine if there's a skinwalker out there. She laughed and gobbled like a turkey loudly into the forest. Jokingly, I said, don't do that, it'll attract one. Not five seconds later, we hear an identical gobble back to us from the forest. It was definitely not an echo. There was no light out there, no paths, and it was very cold, like 30 degrees. I can't imagine anybody would just be hanging out in the woods on the off chance they could mock somebody. What's weirder is that it sounded like her. It sounded as though somebody had recorded her voice and played it back. I just remember saying, oh my God, and then sprinting as fast as I could back to the house. 
I don't think I've ever run so fast or with so much intention in all my life. I didn't turn back, and I was so out of breath it hurt. My friend thought the whole thing was funny, but I didn't. It was so freaky. Did we see or encounter a skinwalker? Or was it something else? 